It's my duty to please the booty. And Muzz got mad at me, the coach said, he goes, Jesus Christ, why don't you just wear two nines? And I went, okay. Ah, ah, switch it oh. Please, please, please never do yeah. that. Yep. So. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 477 of Spittin' Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney. For my friends at New Amsterdam Vodka, here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family, what is up, gang? Happy New Year to everybody. Some of the Chicklets crew still out here in Seattle, some back east. So let's go to Wit Dog first. How was your Happy New Year, buddy? It was phenomenal. You know, it's been a great, uh, what would I say, 10 days since we, we last recorded wow. together? We recorded Feels a little like early, months. so it was a nice little break, and I know that you guys... Uh, you were out in Seattle. You were doing the thing. We have so much to talk about. What an amazing atmosphere that was. At least it seemed that way watching it on TV. But, you know, we, we haven't talked in a while. Christmas was great. I talked a lot about putting that net together myself. I don't know if you guys remember me mentioning that. A little bit. So around 1 a.m., right, you know, you start putting together the net, finding your home. You get everything set up, put, up the, put together the net. Your boy Wit didn't put together the net in the room that the net had to go in. And when I went to put it in the room, it didn't fit. Oh, no. So just an oh, all-time no. asshole <laughs> move by a guy who, you know, should have never tried to do it on his own to begin with. Um, I had to, like, take the back of the net off. There's a middle bar on the net. So if it, if that, if that wasn't there, it would have been okay. Hell of a net, though. Show no Bauer. This net is a beast. So then I had to, like, kind of break it to get it in. So now it's kind of mangled. But for a six-year-old who shoots at maybe three miles per hour, I think it'll be okay to go. But the, just the, I, I'll send you the picture. The fact of the matter is, like, that when I went to put it through the door frame to get into the little hockey room, I wanted to, I wanted to puke. I just about puked. So that was a kick in the dick. But then the morning, it was a blast. You know, I, I remember my father and my mother kind of like filming us with the old school recorders coming down the stairs. Then it was a little fake because you'd already come down about 5 a.m. But, you know, I ended up getting the camera. I'm following the kids behind and they actually hadn't been downstairs yet. So kind of memories that that'll last a lifetime for, for my wife and I and just seeing how fired up they were. And it was it was a great holiday. And then pretty much hung out all week. Then all of a sudden it turns into like, oh my God, they're not in school for a week. We're not going anywhere. We were maybe going to go snowing. There's no snow in the Northeast. It doesn't snow anymore. So we were stuck in the house and I said, holy shit, when does school start again? This is unbelievable. What the hell is wrong with these kids? Why are they acting like this? But then came along. Shout out to all the teachers out there. Oh, you teachers do such a magnificent Saints. job. Saints. What, what an amazing group of people you teachers are. Um, I won't get it. Yeah. So, Even the one that, that crushed their students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Jerry Thornton, the old Jerry Thornton blogs. But um, and then New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve was so fun. Talk about like flashbacks and memories. And so I have a r really close group of friends here. And, and Brian Yandel is one of them. And his middle son, Colin, uh, he made the Catholic Memorial varsity hockey team. He's only in eighth grade. So we saw that the, when their schedule came out, um, they had a three o'clock game against Arlington High, which is a really good public high school program where, you know, kids aren't leaving the town. They're playing for the school, they, the town they grew up in in high school. So, a, <coughs> excuse me, a bunch of our friends went to the game. Colin played awesome. He's buzzing around. He's playing at third period. He's out there every other shift. CM comes back. They tie it up 2-2. Two -two. And then all my friends, including the Yandel boys and all these people came over for New Year's Eve. So it was just so fun. Like I remember being in high school and going to Brian's games when he was on CM before he went to Cushing Academy. And all of a sudden I'm there watching his middle son. Like it was just it was, it was just all these memories are flashing back to your time playing high school hockey, which is the best time ever. I mean, I know Canadians have junior and stuff like that, but American kids, I think for the most part, high school hockey, a lot of times it's the last hockey you'll ever play. It was just a blast to be a part of. And then that night we had all the kids like Ryder, they're up until midnight watching the ball drop. My wife at 8.50, she said, hey, at nine o'clock, let's do a fake ball drop for all the kids. I'm like, you think that's going to happen in 10 minutes? There's 30 kids at the house. Yeah. And... um. I said, no, nah, no, nah, we'll do it at 10. Next thing you know, midnight, we're blowing the horns. Kids are going crazy. So yesterday was uh, just hang out and watch the Winter Classic and then watch that amazing Roll Bowl, uh, Rose Bowl game. It was just a total chill day in the Whitney household. But a phenomenal 10 days off. A lot of memories made. A lot of funny things that went down around the house with the kids and all my friends. So it was a blast. It was a blast. I kind of wished I was out there once I saw the game yesterday, how great of an atmosphere it looked like. But it was also good to kind of recharge the batteries at home as you guys did all the heavy lifting. 
Um, as far as Brian Yandel's kid, now Brian Yandel, and no disrespect to Keith, he was the more skilled player of the two, right? That's what even Keith will tell you. It just so happens he had a body like a milk bag and Keith was a little bit more athletic. So he was able to go on and have this illustrious NHL career where Brian played, I think, at the highest level, the AHL. He played a few games with yeah. Wilkes-Barre Scranton. I know he played in uh, the, for the Phoenix Roadrunners when yep. they were like in the old bar downtown. But ECHL all-star nonetheless and an incredible college player. So his kid has been giving that, given that type of skill set as well. Yes, and and Brian was just one of the silkiest players you've ever seen. I think he was a two-time first-team All-American at UNH. Like oh, man. he would tell you yourself, if he could have skated a little bit better, he would have had a legit chance. But his skill and his vision and everything was always just on on, an, on another level. Um, Colin, his his middle son, he he just put him back to D last year. So I, I didn't know that. I was I was super impressed. He he has the vision like Brian, and actually his oldest son Brian plays at Cushing Academy. He got the call up. As you're listening to this Wednesday, called up to the varsity A team will be his first game. He's only a sophomore at Cushing, so obviously he's got the the genetics of of having kids. He's got another son Liam going to the Quebec tournament in a couple months or in a month. So the the Yandel the Yandel hawkiness it all starts from Buddy Yandel, a hell of a player great player back in the day and i think that all the kids are kind of the same so yeah keith keith's the most recognizable one but brian was skilled as shit would it be safe to say that you think that all three of them at least get to ncaa division one hockey it's hard to say i i i wouldn't i wouldn't even know know how to answer that um it, it's such a crapshoot now and so much can happen from you know age 14 to 18 like it's like uh, merle's merle's line's the best Talk to me after girls and booze is introduced, and then we'll see who the players are, <laughs> right? People, people think their 10-year-old is, star, is destined to be a first-round pick. It's like, buddy, we haven't hit puberty, they haven't met girls, and they've never had a drink, so slow the roll down here. You mean Matt Murley, the biggest villain in, in, the, in the province of British Columbia right now? They got <laughs> wanted posters up in downtown in Yale Town for fucking Merle's head on a platter. There was no chance Merle's thought, and we'll get into what he said in a little bit about Elias Pedersen somehow becoming a Chicago Blackhawk. There was no chance he thought that that was going to blow up like that. He said that off the cuff and boom, Vancouver Does he explodes. Have his, his phone's bugged over there so he lives in the same city as Elias Pedersen does. Like That's where Merles lives in Sweden. Yeah, so, I think that's where he grew up. I don't know if he still lives there. Okay, so so basically he he heard this rumor from the guy down the street making pastries that Elias Pettersson is, is shipping off to Chicago. And keep in mind, isn't Pettersson restricted, a restricted free agent? Yes. yes. I think Merles has better sources than we think. Merles usually doesn't put this shit out there. He was right about Monty. He like he doesn't throw this shit at the wall. Like he's not he's not as much a rumor boy as me and you are, Biz. Like he's pretty connected. So I, 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 I'm just a little bit disgusted and I, I don't know if we're going to get into it later or right now. I might as well get into it right now. I think this is a ploy to disrupt the Vancouver Canucks in the incredible first half of the season they've had. I don't know what vendetta Merles has against the Vancouver Canucks. I don't I've think never, he has one, Biz. I, I don't think I, he has one. I know I, I see a dark twinkle in Merles's eye and, and for the first time in his media career, he's turning into a villain and he likes it. He's turning into the bane of podcasts. He's got the mask on over there. He likes the oh. chaos. As, as much as Merles wants to be this big sweetheart, hey, I just like drinking beer and playing craps and getting the boys into trouble at 4 a.m. and then losing our blouses and then stumbling back to the room as if R.A. wasn't the only guy on the podcast doing it. No, Merles has become a podcast villain, and that was the start of it all. That's my opinion. I just want one more question about the chaos in your household for Christmas. How does the gift unwrapping go? Do you say, hey, Ryder, now it's your turn to go up and, and unwrap a gift, and then everyone pays attention. Oh, cool, you clap. And then, okay, Wyatt, it's your turn. Or is it just like, all right, release the hounds. It's not release the hounds. It's not release the hound. Uh, Ryder does one. Wyatt does one. But it's not one of those like hour-long sessions either where you're like talking and going over every gift. I mean, to be completely truthful, they were probably interested in maybe 3% of what they got. And it turns out the things that you don't even think will even matter 
like end up being the big hit. Like Riders all into soldiers. We got him a costume, like a soldier costume. That was like number one. So and then Wyatt, he wanted all these like hockey guys and these little cars with eyeballs. He calls them my eyeball cars, my eyeball cars. They're from the movie cars. Well, he ended up being into the new backpack we bought him for school. So it was just one of those things. You never know what's going to hit. Oh, and let me get ahead of something else. I gifted myself my ping pong machine. And by gifting myself it, I mean I'd had it for a month, but I didn't know how to set it up because I'm such a joke. So my father-in-law, Dave, came over and he set it up on Christmas. And I released the video, bing, 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 which also, mind you, I played my first opponent, non-family member opponent, and lost on New Year's Eve in a two out of three. Lost both games in a row. I think I'm worse in one-on-one matches since I've been using the machine. Don't know how to explain it. It's like being a Ranger Rick in golf where you stripe it on the range and you get in the course and you hit everything out of bounds like biz <laughs> but in the end i'm now struggling in one-on-one ping pong matches even though my machine game is tight well i posted the video and rider come riders in the video he's just watching me i let rider do the whole internet communities all over me let your kid play including you biz <laughs> let your kid play i gave him more turns than me it just so happened he was very intently watching my film session that yeah. i wanted to tweet out and then i took the brunt of the internet saying i'm a shitbag dad so yeah. didn't appreciate that mean and uncalled for on christmas yeah with lavar ball whitney <laughs> 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 When's Ryder gonna coming out with his own shoe? He's gonna, have a, <laughs> the he's gonna have a ping pong paddle with a pink yeah. Whitney logo on it, and hopefully he'll pay for his college. Oh, so Wait, good! It, it is fun going to high school games. I went out last week to all the Catholic for St. Mary's of Linda. A couple of my buddies' kids play. My uh, Mikey McLaughlin, Patrick Lady, they're on the MC team. But it's just great to go back old, old school. I mean, I obviously didn't play when I was a kid, but it's just fun to have that atmosphere with the no, bands you played hoops. all that shit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, also, oh, the other thing from the CM game. So Mike Motto, who's a former Hobie Baker winner, and he's Brian Yandel's partner on the Rink Shrinks podcast. His brother, Rob, his son's a senior on CM. So I was just catching up with them talking. And unbelievably, this kid, when he was 14 years old, started... Um, uh, landscaping company, right? Where he had like five houses in his hometown of Avon, Massachusetts. Now the kid's going into it. He's a senior in high school. He's got 60 clients in all these different towns. The kid's absolutely killing it. Grass cutting, weeding, all this stuff. I like Realistically, the kid could not go to college and then go even full bore into this thing and set him up for life. It's just amazing to see what, what younger kids with work ethic can do oh, and set them else. Set, like, just an unreal story of a young kid starting on his own and now he's crushing it at 18 years old. So I was forced to have jobs when I was younger, like whether it was a paper route when I was early days. I mean, I've yep. already told the I had story. A paper about, route. I mean, I shit my pants on my paper route and finish my paper route. If you kids want to learn about work ethic, that's okay? having a heart. It's in biz, these, right? these funny business. Some brown stuff. <laughs> <that funny. laughs> I, I was like, for some reason, I was talking the other day with the ends about it, and he actually shit his pants when he was doing his paper route. He used to do it on rollerblades, and there was a spot where he could like jump up and always clear, but he had he had to shit. But for whatever reason, he didn't not do the jump that he normally done did along the route and so he like did this huge leap and as he finished in like the jump squat position he just completely blew out his jeans and i think he was going commando at the time oh and oh buddy so he he got back kind of like me put the the I ended up stuffing my shitty underwear at the bottom of the hamper instead of just throwing them in the garbage like how I'm stupid surprised is you that? didn't put it in one of the papers <laughs> So, a little shitty but, surprise in the sports but, section. But then again, you have more than one pair of underwear. But as Yans brought up, he's like, buddy, when you're younger, like you don't have many pairs of jeans, right? Like I wasn't a, I don't think any of us were spoiled kids where when you're what, 12 years old, you have like, I don't know, seven, eight pairs of jeans no, in your closet. Oh, so he not. needed these carpenter jeans for, you know, wherever he was going next to do something that you need jeans on. Where to jeans go skateboarded. For. So he put his airwalks. He put them in the hamper as well. So I, uh, I think his older sister had a bunch of her girlfriends over at the time, and they were all just sitting around the kitchen table. And the, and his dad came in. He goes, "Hey, idiot! Next time you shit your pants, let me know so I don't <laughs> stuff my hand in the fucking wa- you know washer bin." And I fucking touch your shit. And he said he said he was mortified. He's never been so embarrassed in his life. He ended up just putting his putting his bowl of cereal in the fucking sink and then beelined out of there. So sure enough, me and Yans had our own shit in our pants story doing our paper out. But back to the work ethic thing is, buddy, a lot of these 
kids end up racking up all this student loan and they don't I know, know what the f- their lives are in shambles before they even get out of college and they don't even end up using the degree that they went and got go do something like starting a landscaping company get start getting clients early on even when trade you're in school. high school as a summer job then trade you end up school, learning, right. yeah tra- a trade school that, yeah. but he, I, I heard a stat that for every seven trades that are retiring there's only one to replacing them now. Now, listen, the internet can it. be a, a fucked up place and give you bunk stats, but to find good trades nowadays, it's fucking nearly impossible. And these guys, because they're such a demand, they also run their business and then they do these side cash jobs. Most of them are probably pulling in 200K a year mm. and, yeah. and part of which is cash. So just going back to your point with like finding not only that work ethic, but fucking not racking up the student loan, not knowing what you're going to fucking do with it. So Boomer Biz over here just figured he should chime in about the kid's work ethic. No, I respect that, Biz. That was the grind my gears for today's pod, by the way. Okay, fair enough. There we go. Uh, Biz, did you do anything exciting on New Year's Eve? I know we kind of saw you earlier than night. I know we could separate. There was not much going on for us. No, I was in bed at 1030. I was pretty gassed because we had that appearance in Seattle. And I don't know if we want to get into it now. I had a great time in Cabo over the break. Uh, but then, uh, you know, got, got three rounds of golf in with my buddy, Eric How'd Carls. How'd you play, dude? I was okay. I shot nice. 87, 88. Oh. Keep in mind that the course isn't as long as what we normally play. It's a little bit, little bit shorter, but it was nice. Like if you hit a tee shot, 230 yards, you were 150 yard approach shot. So that, that's like a par four. I, I was, it was just a nice time yeah. playing, get out in the sun. Cabo is a great time. Have you ever been to Cabo? Yeah, I went to Cabo on the, um, it would have been Olympic break um, in 2014. And I remember uh, Sam Gagne was there. Taylor Hall came right after he got stepped on by Corey Potter with that vicious scar he had on his forehead. It was right after that. And my buddy Ned and my buddy Donley, they came with me. And we had an absolute blast, dude. We had, I, I, was, I loved that place. It was awesome. So p- probably since you've been, it's probably like doubled, if not tripled in size. The really? amount of people that are moving, uh, you go to the airport, the amount of private jets. So at, from a per capita standpoint, most most billionaires with residencies. So the the amount of Michelin star restaurants that it have, the amount of unbelievable resorts that it's had, it's just really popped off. I don't go towards the chaos where it's like actually like the Cabo San Lucas part where every dude's offering you cocaine on the side of the road. You, you, know, you want to fly to the moon. I stay on the San Jose side where they have portals, Porto Los Cabos. And it's just, they got their own little vibe kicking up there more so in all these little private communities. So I hung out at that side. They have their like private beach on the one, in the one area and, and got a little bit of R and R, but then uh, on the 29th, it was off to Seattle and boys, I would say that this is probably, this will go down as my favorite winter classic to date. Nothing against Boston. No, it was just the the people like not to say they weren't friendly in Boston, but I just feel like they were actually extra, extra friendly here where they just were craving this sort of event. And the amount of Alaskans that I met over the last four days, like even f- so f- so for the NHL to throw this event in the Pacific Northwest where they have this new team and the amazing fan base that they've created, people from Alaska in the wintertime, it's a little depressing. They're getting like two, three hours of sunlight. They don't have a pro sports team anymore because the Alaska Aces left. They do have college teams and stuff like that, but they don't get this type of thing. So for them to pop over, I think it's a, maybe a two, three hour flight and they came out in droves and, wow. and the representation that the state of Alaska had as far as the hockey community it was just, it was awesome to see. And uh, starting with the event that we had on our first night at the press box, with like I thought it was going to be kind of one of these very chill, laid back winter classics. Like, oh, okay, maybe not as chaotic as Boston, buddy. It was fu- the sports the fans. It was see- crazy, bud. It the li- they had to yeah, cut off the line right. at one point. It was, it was, it was. I thought, I thought it would be laid back there too, and you ended up getting pounced on, huh? Pounded, That's awesome. Pounded. I think every every other person in line was handing RA a bag of something. RA, oh, our, RA went Christ. from the most sober guy in the world from the start of the <laughs> where we had to basically keep him standing up by the end of it. RA, <laughs> yes, no. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I 
it was tough to get a tough to get a cocktail in there, so I had to whack whack back a couple gag. What do you call it? Uh, high noons at at a, at a time. But no, I woke up with with a fucking forest in my pocket the next day. Like, and we didn't even set put the bat signal. Like, oh, we we need weed in Seattle. There's plenty of it. People are just super generous. Like, they just you know had had a bunch of like one uh what free rolls, oneies, whatever. They hooked us up big time. So didn't even have to go to the dispensary. That's that's a pretty pretty much. A Biz, trip how was that. um how was Marshawn Lynch? Seems like the man. The man. Just a, a, a an absolute character. And I had no clue until I got here that he was actually given part ownership of the team. And I was like, I didn't know that. How did that happen? And he said that he got invited to this like mob style dinner at an Italian restaurant and they were eating like a, a smorgasbord of pasta and lobster. And then all of a sudden, like, the word ownership popped up and he was like, what? Like I could be a part owner in a hockey team here and not have to pay into it. I think that it, it's just basically he represents and, and was given us a, a small chunk of it. So, I mean, obviously a minority owner, there's 12 owners for the Seattle crack and I didn't realize how many they had. So a little bit different than Foley situation in Vegas, where he's got maj majority stake, if not all stake in that, in that team. So, um, but he said, man, I was asking him, I said, you've had so many iconic moments in Seattle and, and amazing memories that you've you know created for this city. Cause they, they love him. Like he's probably the most beloved. Yeah. Maybe you could put Ichiro up there because he'd spent so long, Ken Griffey and all those guys, but you know, he's probably the most well-known as of late. And, uh, I said, like, if you could recreate one moment and he said, honestly, man, he goes, those are in the past. I think the best is yet to come. The fact that I'm a black kid from Oakland and I have ownership in a hockey team in Seattle to me is one of my greatest achievements. And he said that, you know, I think the best is ahead of us. And if we could bring a Stanley cup here, he said that that would be his, his biggest achievement that he's ever accomplished in his life. So I was like, Holy fuck, dude! I was getting a little emotional as he was saying this, and so no, we had to cut no out. discussion about the one yard line. You left, left that. No, let that I didn't want to. I just, I didn't know if because like, the the energy was so good and yeah. it was so positive. Like I didn't know if that would set he him just off. Or, you. He just, yeah, all of a sudden a right turn, and I, I, I got a grill like him. But um, we'll have all that coming out, Biz, too, on in the Chicklets TV episode. Oh, you guys nice. had a long chat. You guys had great chemistry. I said by the end of it, I'm like, they're going to start their own podcast together. He was loving you. So it'll all be in the Chicklets TV episode. And it, so, it, I mean, it was great to talk to him for about 12 to 15 minutes. But as you know, Marsha likes the weed just like RA and probably even more. So half the discussion was us going through hockey terms and he was relating back to marijuana. So okay. we're not going to, okay. but the good news is, is the NHL and working with them, they allowed the Chicklets cameras to be behind the scenes with us. So you'll be able to see most of that on the vlog on the Spit and Chicklets YouTube as, uh, as Grinnell mentioned. So we had some fun stuff going on with Bowie the whole weekend. And, uh, and I have a question up. about that. So yeah. There's no chance like you didn't break one of his ribs when you jumped on him. Like, have oh, you been have you been served or like have you been notified by the police yet? Because that guy's probably mangled. Like, there's We're a human basically inside in that a, suit. And an Amber Heard and uh, what's the other guy? <laughs> Johnny, uh, Depp. Johnny, Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp legal oh, battle God. right now, hitting each other back with restraining. It's getting ugly. Like, I might, I might never financially recover from this, as the Tiger King once said. Like, you jumped on, you hit him with the cold shoulder, one of the best reverse hits I've ever seen. It Peter was like Forsberg. What, it was like what Kaprizov did to Dylan before he then cross-checked him and injured him. But then to jump on top of him, uh, he broke a rib and he's going to get sued because there's a little human in there that's probably sweating his balls off. I know from being the Orlando Solar Bears guy. And then to get like a giant 215 pounder landing on you, like I would probably be calling the police as well. I, 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 I mis, misperformed the people's elbow. I thought it was a whole body check. It was just supposed to be the elbow. So once I landed on him and realized that it was his sternum, I felt a little bit bad. But considering that he'd been stalking me and, and hanging out outside the hotel and just being the anarchist that this troll they've created is, um, I didn't feel that bad. So this will continue. It's not over. He's already tweeted that out. I would say that round one goes to me. Oh, Is by a landslide. 10 by a landslide. I mean, it was nice to finally get a W after uh, Bettman roasted me on the panel. And then everything that has happened over the past week with Butch Goring coming Shoving coming you back alive locker. after five days of complete silence. Now, is he running his own Twitter account? Is I, he, I don't know. The shitting on you part made me think like it's got to be a ghostwriter. Like to say I don't wear underwears because I'd rather shit on your chest is like 
that's so fucked up for like an old guy to say. I feel like maybe from a younger generation, you'd be like, all right, yeah, he's into the Cleveland steamer. But Butch Goring dropping that, I, I think he's got a ghostwriter now. And I, I feel like this- a younger person, though, when is has that like, fuck, I can't put this on the Internet. An old guy is like, I'm. it's the Internet, whatever. It'll get de- deleted tomorrow. Like, they don't so know I like that- Butch Goring. I also don't see Butch Goring having like a publicist type. Like, you know, these old school guys don't do the publicist. They speak for themselves. I know, and, but you can grab a nephew who's like into the RA stuff off the ice and just be yeah, like, yo, tweet for me. But then he would probably understand how to quote tweet and work it properly <laughs> where he doesn't yeah. really know, but yet it's still I think the I think the the I don't wear dump I I, I don't wear diapers because I'd rather shit on you all the time has over two million. So he is just firing off tweets like I, like a I don't think it's man. phony too. I, I think I've been told he's he's genuinely not not too uh, too thrilled with your biz too. Like it's not a put on. I mean he is an older guy. I don't think you know all the guys boomers. They don't really know how to joke around on the internet. I don't think so. I, I don't think this is a put on from his side for sure. Is are are the Islanders playing in those outdoor games in New York? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you we'll think see him, a, biz. You we'll, think there's we'll a definitely possible? run into him. I think I, I think I gotta go buoy style and and troll him and follow him around and to the point where maybe I get the restraining order slapped on me. He so, might just grab a big bag of papers like he's on a paper route like you used to and ooh. just shit on you instead of in his own pants okay. while doing the daily well, newspaper. Route. Yeah. A lot of shit talk this podcast. A lot of shit talk. Boys, before we do dive into the game, we do want to uh, thank our friend Wayne Gretzky uh, last week for the uh, surprise Christmas drop. Hopefully everybody enjoyed that as much as we enjoyed doing it. Uh, seemed like I, I can't believe we were able to keep a secret that long. Uh, nobody knew about it. So big thanks to Wayne once again. It was nice to bump in him down here as well. That uh, also- story, though, of, of him in the basement with the Russians and his buddy, local buddy, holding up the KGB so the Russian dudes could have a, a couple pops. I saw a bunch of tweets. I was dying. It's like, so Wayne ended the Cold War. <laughs> it's, it's, that's how it went down, folks. If, if, if All Wikipedia and history books will change now. Wayne Gretzky ended the Cold War in Russia. Don't it get is started about, don't ask Wayne about the history books because that's what RA did in our little New Year's Eve dinner. Starts grill, grilling him about the Civil War questions. Next no, thing you know, Wayne was out of there. He did it again. I, know. I knew. He did it again. I was waiting for to make up, Wayne make this to up. bed. You all, made him leave again? No. Twice. No, I knew Grinnelly was going to make this story up and pretend that's what happened. Not, not at all. Ask I asked Keith. Him and, ask Keith. Keith said it. What? Wait a I, minute, I, R.A. No, R. A. Let, don't listen first to First it was Adam Oates a better disher, and now he, you, you're bringing up no, the politics? If, if, who are you going to believe? Do you think I actually chased him away? We, he stumped me on a trivia question, and then I asked him and Keith one, and I stumped both of them. And and Wayne was doubting my my answer, and then he kind of gave me one of those. He, I didn't chase him away. He didn't leave because because I stopped him on a trivia question. I will say all. it was a great trivia question. It was Can a I great try to get it? Can I try to get yeah, it? Yeah, yeah let's the one do I've this. stumped a million people on. The, the two two NHL nicknames that are inspired by the Civil War. The one is very obvious one, and then the one's the one the other one people usually don't get. Okay, so Maybe not so obvious. So there's two so there's two I'm assuming it's the Columbus Blue Jackets. Easy. Yep, that's the easy one. Yep. And the other one. East Co- East Conference or Western Conference? Don't give them a don't even give them yeah, a clue. See, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't give them hints until they finally couldn't get it. And then when I gave them hints, the Wayne guessed right. And then he's like, No, nah, I know, sir. I was like, No, it really is. I'm not I wasn't making it up why why this team was named what they were. I certainly wasn't making anything up. Uh, but I did stop them both. We can get back to it if you want to mull it over for a minute. I Actually, think you you know, just well, tell them the answer. Just tell them yeah, the answer. Well, All right. Calgary Flames. They were they were based in Atlanta. Atlanta Flames. They were wow. famously the city of Atlanta famously burned down during either the Civil War or the War of 1812. One of those wars. I think it was the Civil War. Uh, and yeah, the city was burned so down. So if that is actually Atlanta if that Flames. was the question, and then he left after that, I can't say that that's RA running him out of town. Yeah, yeah. but no, when no, RA starts no, no, no. talking about the War of 1812 and stuff like that, <laughs> yeah, I don't, that's and, and we're sitting there. It's like RA brought out a musket, I, and, and I know and nothing with, about the War of 1812. Like, All right, dude, I, I gotta no. go to bed. Keep in mind. Keep Dude, I'm to pack he, this powder. He, 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 he's he's halfway through this forest that was in his pocket, so it's not like it's an articulate conversation. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah. yeah. He's like, ah, no, I must I was, get fun. I was pr- pretty much dead sober. Huberdo can't score like the ah, young Southern losers. But he is a better passer than you. Yeah. 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 Uh, fucking goons. Oh, let's get into yeah. the game yeah. and Joey to- friggin' Decord. Holy yeah. shit. Unbelievable. Uh, very first shout out in a winter classic, the Boston boy, three nothing win by Seattle. 
what, let's go to you first. I, I know you were talking about this guy in the chat earlier. What do you know about Joey? He's, he's a local kid, but we didn't hear too much about him until he, yeah, he's been on this run with Seattle. So I, I don't know that much about him, but in reading more and, and talking to his agent, Jerry Buckley, it's a crazy story, right? I mean, this is a kid who was there for the beginning of Arizona State hockey. He got to experience that team becoming D1 and, and turning into what is now an amazing place to play with their new arena. And then he's basically grinded for everything he's ever got. I, I heard uh, McCann being interviewed after and just saying like he doesn't take anything for granted because he's had to work for everything he hasn't not a high draft pick like myself given starts given games let's see what you can do we'll throw you out till you fail no this kid has had to do every single thing on his own his dad's actually the uh the goalie coach at bu great guy brian decord he's had a very successful kind of goalie training program in massachusetts for a long time and so i think having a dad that knew what he was doing probably obviously helped the kid growing up but i think being such a late bloomer and now being a part of this Seattle team who don't forget like Grubauer has not worked out there he's making a ton of dough he's injured well Drieger is also making three and a half so like no one would have thought going into this season that Decor would be there saving their season because right now they're 7-0-2 in their last nine they've now won five in a row and it's all in the backs of him he's playing incredible I think a big part of it is last year he went on that amazing run with Coachella they got to game seven overtime of the Calder oh. Cup man like they deserve to get a win his save percentage and goals against was phenomenal throughout the AHL playoff run and it's just cool to see someone that that comes out of nowhere in a sense right like you're so used to the big prospects and all of a sudden you're looking at a fan base and they're checking out who they have coming up and no one's thinking of anything to do with Joey Decord and now he's there and he's just He's making the most out of an opportunity that not many people thought he would even get. So to see him go in and get the first shutout in the history of the outdoor classic or the winter classic, and then be so like genuine after when he's talking oh, about man. how much he appreciates being there, it's just a really cool story. And 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 forget the story and his career arc and how how it's going. Seattle's getting going again. They were trash, and they still have a long way to go. But without him, I don't know if they're even talking about possibly making the playoffs. Now they could kind of set their sights on continuing this run and trying to get in the mix a little bit more. Yeah, so, I mean, not a not a great start to the season for them. And I would have wrote them off at, like, like other than this 10-game stretch that they've been on. And since he's taken over, uh, since Grubauer's injury, I want to say he's 9-1 and one before the end of the game because we were talking about the stats in the midst of the broadcast. Uh, 1.71 goals against average in that stretch and like a, a 9.45 save percentage. So he's just been on this absolute tear, right? And like you said, without him, I don't think that they're – within striking distance of that wild card. As they sit right now, they're one point out of a playoff spot. Keep in mind, though, they have dealt with injuries. They, the Burakovsky was not in the lineup. That's a huge power forward piece. Two-time Stanley Cup champion with that leadership in the locker room. Uh, Eberle went down with like a laceration at some point. He didn't miss like a crazy amount of time. <clears throat> and then... Um, McCann Schwartz. missed some time. McCann missed some time. And then Schwartz, who's another guy who's won a Stanley Cup and a bit of a honey badger. But... I think just overall with this little run they've been on and with them getting their guys back healthy and starting to find that rhythm of having that four, that four second line mentality where you can just roll out these waves and waves and waves and maintain that pace of play, like shift in, shift out. Man, I, I mean, I had them making playoffs in the beginning of the year. I was doubting that after that horrible start. But buddy, they're fucking looking good. And as far as he's concerned, um, uh, Decord, cool to hear all the chants he said that he'd been getting some chance at the climate pledge arena but to get it in an arena you know three four times the size of that at the outdoor game that's a that's a memory he's never going to forget he was um, saying uh biz he was saying like uh, uh, so they were writing about how there's never been a shutout in one of these games and he was mentioning like the sight lines are so different with not having the fans right against the glass so that at the beginning was a little confusing and then also the whole like there's a chance uh, you know Eichel hit the post whoever hit the post and then you don't hear the reaction for like two to three seconds so I think at the beginning of the game it's probably pretty awkward for goalies maybe one of the reasons nobody's ever pitched a shutout but the save he made late in the third on Eichel dude like what an absolute stamp on that game by him because at that point it was over unfortunately the game wasn't too exciting it, it, it was still fun to watch because of the whole atmosphere but the game was whatever but then you know you want him to get that shout out he robs Eichel with a sick glove save it was like the perfect way to end it for him but it was just impressive to kind of see how appreciative he was after about the crowd support like you could tell it meant a lot to him 
Oh, big time. And then uh, I, I texted Greg Powers, his, uh, his coach at ASU, and in his first ever game in college hockey, they played at Notre Dame, and he got shelled for nine. And after the second, Powers came up to him. He said, hey, do you want to come out? And he's like, fuck no. And that's just kind of that, like that Vasilevsky type mentality where it's like, no, I'm not fucking bailing out on my teammates. Sure as shit, two years later, he ends up leading them to their first ever tournament bid where that was the first time that ASU had ever been in the NCAA Frozen Four tournament. I don't know. I don't know how far they went in that one, but you mentioned like the it, it's kind of fitting like this this new NHL franchise and kind of reviving its season where you had this you know non traditional hockey market NCAA team where he helped bring him and revive him to that you know the tournament for the first time. So it's uh, it's a really cool story. I hope it keeps going. And you know you saw the 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 magical run they had last year, coming one goal away from the conference finals in only the second year of creation. Well, who knows, man? Maybe. Joey decords the answer and he goes on this insane magical run where with goalies I mean was it was it was it Scott Layton the one year with uh, with the with Michael Layton or yeah. Michael Layton yeah. with the Flyers like how many times have we seen just a goalie come out of nowhere and and save a team season and then go on a run the like, Hamburglar I mean, remember the yeah. Hamburglar the Hamburglar dude when how went, about uh, when Flurry got injured the year we went to the Cup Finals. Uh, and lost to Detroit, the team I was on, Ty Conklin comes in, and for 30 games, I think, just went on a, a complete tear. Yeah. Goaltending is so yeah, bizarre. Right. We've talked about it all year. Every team needs one now. Third, the, the third string goalies that they don't even really have, but all of a sudden, guys are coming up that were third on the depth chart. They're saving team seasons. It's the most bizarre position. You can't really plan ahead because every guy we see have a good year and sign a deal it's like all of a sudden the next year half of them are playing like shit so it's just a crap shoot but um the other thing i took away from the game and edzo and uh kenny and and bush were talking about it adam larson on seattle might be one of the most underrated defensemen in the league i was i was chatting with him at that we were at a bar last night called what is it queen's alley good guy Unbel- buddy their their team that's that's one of the other things i was going to mention never underestimate a group of guys that loves each other and just have a great group they were all out celebrating maddie Beneers, beauty vince dunn man missile beauty leading the fucking team and scoring as a d-man talk to adam larson uh grubauer uh Alexiak. like they these guys are just fucking great dudes yeah. and they love each other and they love playing for one another uh yamamoto is another one but i'll hand it back over and i'll get into that stuff after no i just i was you're so impressed like the size of Larson he's never going to put up a ton of points but defensively like a true top four and he's playing on he's playing with Vince Dunn and they're just those two together I think they're playing together right Biz I think uh, they were the for, pair. For, for, for part of the game at least the parts that I were when I was not uppercut and buoy and and, and, <laughs> and trying to avoid him as much as possible but uh, an awesome an awesome player shut down D-man and, and I think like having him there makes a huge difference and also their team while this year hasn't gone as they'd hoped but last year was this amazing run beating Colorado they have like eight kids, I think, in the World Juniors. Their prospect pool is phenomenal. That's not even including Shane Wright, who's taken his time. That's okay. We've talked about that. He's not going to get rushed up to the NHL, but it is a super bright future for the Kraken. And then to hear you say about how much the fans love the team and how much the city's buying in, it's an awesome story. And another example of, of a new NHL team just thriving immediately. Uh, we got a chance to hang out with Burakovsky and uh, Tanev, Turbo. Brandon Tanev's like he's buddy. He's one of the fucking biggest beauties behind the scenes in the National Hockey League. Like if he was in a bigger market, you guys would see his personality flourish even more. But he, I think he's the the emotional. Get rid of that guy. He's the emo. uh, Did they have to? Or did was it? I think he, they, was he. Oh, they, yeah. they didn't. I think they put him. him up for the for the draft. Yeah, he's yeah he's the sandpaper they could definitely use right now. But they got him and Yamamoto on the fourth line. So we talk about a team that has depth, and that was another cool story. So Yamamoto obviously wanted to go back to the Oilers. They gave him his opportunity. He was a first rounder there. Loved it there, but when he knew that wasn't going to be a reality, he told his agent, "Do everything in your power to bring me back to my home home state, right?" Because he played down the road in Spokane. That's where he's from. And I got to meet his old man. Oh my god, his old man's a fucking beauty too. <laughs> he was the fucking drunkest guy at that Queens Queens Alley or wherever we were. But not he's in a on bad RA's way. couch in his hotel no, room right no, now. Not, still. not in an RA way. Just being an absolute beauty with the greasiest goatee you've ever seen in your life. And so to for him to for to say that and to get to come back and and play where really his heart is. That's another cool story that I found from the, the game too. So I'm I'm finding myself super 
super obsessed with the Seattle team all of a sudden. And all it took was for me to come to this outdoor winter classic and, and kind of get to know what the bread and butter of this team is. Did, did you see the prank that uh, Maddie Benitez played on last? And I guess his, his girlfriend or his wife was cutting his hair recently. And, and while they were doing it, she took a picture of him with a wicked bowl cut. Like he looked like dumb and dumb and dumber there. And Benitez got a copy of it and made t-shirts for the whole team. So when he walked to the room, every guy in the locker room had a t-shirt with Lawson with like an ugly bowl cut picture on it. And, and Benitez so, is a, um, you know, it's been a little bit of a struggle, right? The old sophomore slump thing's pretty legit in the NHL and, and I think you could see his second half kind of explode. If this team gets going, all of a sudden it's been a slow start. He didn't score his first 10 or 11 games, maybe more. So I think I think second half you're going to see a different Beniers, the one closer to last year. And that, that would just propel this offense even more. So I love hearing, like, this is the coolest thing about these winter classics. And as they maybe get old for viewers on TV, it, we've always said they're made for the people that are at yep. the game. And, like, just you guys getting out there for the first time Chicklets has been, been in Seattle and, like, being all into the team and the fan base, it's a great thing. So I'm rooting for him to get it going. Um, as far as Beniers, too, just quickly, R.A., like, but you're – you know, they, we talk about the having four second lines. They don't really have that, you know, Kopitar that was there for him to kind of be groomed by. So all of a sudden, I mean, in that division, you're being thrown to the wolves as that first <laughs> line center being in your second year. We're talking about, look at, look at the centermen that the Vegas Golden Knights have. So you're playing a game like that. Even if you're getting the third line matchup as Matty Beneers, you can't disappear and get a few. Or easy LA. Shit. LA. Uh, how about fucking the Oilers? I mean, how about Vancouver now? So the list goes on and on and on and how deep and powerful the Western Conference is. I mean, for Colorado, I know they're in the other division, but I mean, it's a tough, 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 tough lineup to escape. So as far as Maddie, I agree with you. I think he's going to have a big second half, but I mean, get, give the kid a little breathing room here. He's only in his second year and he's going up against these monsters night in and night out. Yeah, from the fan perspective, Biz, I thought I thought everything was great. The weather was perfect. The, they had the roof open. The you know what is it? The retractable roof. And people, gee, what were they in line? Like two hours before the game, there had to be tens of thousands of people in line just waiting to get in the building. I think just to take in the atmosphere. You could tell, like you said earlier, Biz, people are genuinely happy to hear. Every time they come up to me or Pasha, gee, how, is, you having a good time? Is everything great? Like they were making They're sure like, here, that we take were having this a good water. Time. All right, here, try a water. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, put in this IV. Hey, now, um, uh, the other thing was so. It might have been, um, it was right after Christmas, like 27th, 28th. The uh, outdoor game I played in in Buffalo was on TV. I'm like, Ryder, come here. This is me. I swear to God, I played in the NHL. Come here. He said, this is so slow. I'm like, yeah, no shit. But, but the funny thing was, around the arena then, it was like, you could see all the wooden planks and you could see like, it just didn't have like what it now looks like yesterday with the ship and they're all Shipwreck. walking around the wooden ship. They got the fake uh, Kraken monster in the background. They got the little rink for the kids. It was like on TV, what it's turned into. And granted that, I mean, that was 14 years ago now, but it's so incredible compared to what the first one had watching on TV and just seeing all the garbage basically outside the, the actual rink. So that was pretty cool. Besides the fact that my son still doesn't believe I played that, that was one of the points I wanted to hammer home like the NHL and what they've done with these outdoor games like they have they have blown these things up these are the things that I most look forward to going to now and to see all the people that it takes to make that thing operate they put so much time and energy in this and all these hands on deck behind the scenes with the NHL like Steve Mayer is a big name who ends up like he he actually missed the game unfortunately he had a, a, a you know a family member pass away and he's a big component to the NHL and how they operate but I mean he's there he, he was there like two weeks ahead of time missing time away from his family around the holidays to making sure this the whole thing's organized organized among all the other people so a round of applause to the nhl to making these so enjoyable i i we were at a italian place eating last night and i just ran into some rad, random seattle guy not even a big hockey fan but he had all the cracking gear on i said oh did you go to the game he goes he goes yeah i said how how'd you enjoy it he goes buddy he goes that was easily easily the greatest sporting event i've ever been to i paid 200 dollars, and the amount of uh respect they showed to all the prior athletes and the the, the show that they put on yeah. he goes i got 20 times my money's worth i feel like i stole that ticket so yeah. to hear that about a guy going to an event and how much it impacted him i was you know it, it made me a little bit more fired up and i couldn't agree more so round Did of they applause announce next year's no but there's rumors and we can talk about that right now get it They're, going rumor boy get it going i'm here in chicago again wrigley field connor oh, 
I, uh, yeah, but you I mean, say shocker, buddy, but you get to see Connor Bedard at the Winter Classic. Like, no, fuck. it makes it, it 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 makes sense. Once they got him, this was kind of everyone's complaint that all of a sudden the Blackhawks will be shoved down your yeah, throat. But Black I Hawks tweeted invitation. out over the break when he scored that friggin' goal. I think oh. it was. I don't know if I tweeted after. Yeah, it was after his like lacrosse goal. Um, I I will watch Chicago play now because of him. I I like watching them play. Last year I wouldn't have watched them no matter what. One player, and now it's like, all right, I'm buying in. I'll watch every game that they're on TV. So I get it. It's just the fact that I think Chicago already has the most of any team. Right. Well, it makes sense. One of the biggest TV markets. Now the other rumor buzzing around is the U Arena. Is that what they call it? The U at Ohio State University. Is that how it's the, the, horseshoe? the building? Is it the horseshoe? Is it the horseshoe? Yeah. I'm not the a horseshoe, college guy yeah. here. Yeah, the horseshoe. And Columbus would be hosting, and I think the other team would be Detroit. Now, Columbus doesn't get a lot of stuff like this, and I think that they, considering how crazy they are, the, the sports fans there, they would sell it out. I think that that would be cool to see as well, and especially yep. with the way that Fantilli's popping off now too. I don't know how many people are tuning into Columbus games, but because Bedard's doing what he's doing, he's taking a lot of the headlines. Fantilli's lighting the lamp as of as of late as well. You like can do Ohio State, Michigan, two biz on that, and that would be perfect for college as well. What do you mean? You like, could like if they, NCAA game. Yeah, if they play, if they play at Ohio State, Ohio State's biggest rival, Michigan, Michigan, Ohio State at the Horseshoe, like that would be banana lands, and the NHL can capitalize on it. So they would do one day after the next. Yeah, I mean, it's like when they went to Fenway Park and they were doing college games at Fenway Park as well. Like they, it, I think it's best when like not it's not just one game being played in these arenas. You can get three or four days. Like when we were in Raleigh, North Carolina, they had the two club hockey teams, UNC versus NC State, playing out there. Like I think as many games as you can get on these outdoor rinks, like make it worth it for everyone. I love that. I love yeah, that. I'll do you think? Do you think that those two college hockey teams could sell it out? In a second. Yes. If there's any two schools that could do it, it would be those two. So that would easily be the biggest attendance in college hockey history. Well, Michigan State and Michigan played at the big house a few years ago outdoors. And it was, I think, I mean, they filled that arena. I mean, fill, filled that stadium. That's over 100,000. So if the they horseshoe filled can beat that the, up for a college hockey game. Oh, yeah. Do you have, oh, yeah. like, are we talking like a Trump inauguration type sellout here? Or are no, we talking, no. Like, can I see a picture of this? Yeah, I'll get you over 110,000. Okay. Wow. That yeah. would be, that would be massive. So either, I think it's a win-win either way. Um, off the board pick, I would like to see ASU in Tempe and, and the Coyotes get one. I think that would be a, a great place. And in the wintertime there at nighttime, it cools down. It's dry. I think the ice would be perfect. So yeah, they have one in LA. They could do one in yeah. Tempe. Yeah, yeah they, do one they did LA. one at the they Cotton Bowl. Bowl. Yeah, did a Cotton Bowl. We yeah, were down it was there freezing that game too. Yeah, it was. That's, that's the when last we saw the greatest them. kick out of a game, walk of shame oh, of yeah. all time by Corey the Perry. Worm. I think we've uh, stroked Seattle off quite yeah, a bit here as far absolutely. as Vegas is concerned. They had the. They stink the, right now. They, they, listen, I talked to Gary Lawless. He made a great point. He goes, Biz, they've played 38 games in the first two and a half months of the season. They start out 11 0 1, the best start for a Stanley Cup champion. They were bound to have a little bit of a setback and a sense of energy, lack of practice time, and also. Aiden Hill's injured right now, and so is Shea Theodore, a big a big engine that drives offense from the back end, and they're missing him right now. Listen, excuses. I'm not worried at all. I'm not yeah. worried one fucking bit. We they have they have 44 games in the last three and a half months of the season, so they'll be able to rest up and get back in their game. This this one was all about Seattle. I think it was a perfect timing win for them. It was great for the fan base, but as you just said, with I wouldn't be fucking batting an eye. This team is still dangerous, and they would still easily be in my top five cup favorites, if not top three. Yeah, I mean, n nobody in the conference has more points than them. The only two teams that have more points right now are Boston and the Rangers. So he, despite this little bit of hiccup lately, because Vegas is still in a pretty goddamn good position right now, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Uh, one other note, too, we did mention Chicklets TV. We did make a little visit down to Pike Place, uh, the famous location in Seattle where they do a little fish tossing. So we won't spoil anything. We'll get to that a little bit later when, we, when the video is going to drop. Gee, do we have a date uh, on when the video is going to drop for the Yeah, folks? it should drop next week. Uh, but uh, wait, you'll love it. RA was trolling Seahawks fans. I don't think the younger generation really understood what he was doing but I'll, I'll just tell it now like he asked everyone pass or run pass or run he was just going up to random people pass or run pass or run and it was rattling some people they yeah. still clearly aren't over that but the vlog will be awesome chicklets tv it should be out next week
They're like, yeah, you should have passed the blunt instead of hitting it. Dude. Get out of my face with that <laughs> yeah, microphone. You can tell right away if they were like old enough, though. They were just gutted. But yeah, it was a great time. Also, shout out to uh, Amanda Jack and my friend Mo uh, from home. I hadn't seen them in years, so it was nice to catch up with them way out here in Seattle. But moving right along, Biz, your Leafs uh, stumbling a bit of late, dropped five out of six. They're still third in the Atlantic with 41 points. Uh, but they sent goalie Ilya Samsonov down to the AHL. Molly's hoping to get his confidence and his game back. Uh, he's 5-2-6, and six, but with an 8-6-2 save percentage, 3-9-4 goals against. Not too pretty. Uh, they recalled Dennis uh, Hildeby from the AHL. He's been pretty good for them this year, 7-5-3 and three with a 2-2-0, uh, 9-1-9 save percentage. A couple of shutouts. Uh, Biz, is this a little hiccup in the road for you boys or what? What's the, what's going on here? Well, first of all, I've been hitting up all the Reddit threads uh, from Leafs Nation, <laughs> and this Dennis Hildeby, he might be the Six, next guy. He might be the next Vasilevsky. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> I'm hearing Vesna aspirations. So I've said this all along. It's just a matter of time before one of these goalies we've never heard of in, in the organization that comes from the, the depths of the minors and comes and saves us. So I'm not worried one bit. This happens every year. We stumble a little bit out of the gate. Everybody freaks out. And then midway through the season, right before All-Star and around the holidays, yep, another hiccup. Who gives a fuck? They're going to make playoffs. Everything's going to work itself out. It's our year. I'm not hitting the panic button. I mean, it, there's a correlate at the, fine, the, the time that I stop paying attention and I go on vacation that all this chaos happens and they send their number one goalie or what they thought was going to be their number one goalie down to the minors. Listen, he can go season a little bit, get some easy puck shot on him, get his confidence back. And if this Dennis held to be doesn't turn out to be Vasilevsky like I'm predicting, big deal. Samsonov will come on and save the show. And if not him, we still got Joseph Wall who another guy who has Vesna aspirations, as I read from the, the Toronto Maple Leafs Reddit threads. And We're fine. he's got the high ankle sprain that Fleury had when Ty Conklin came in. So if they can get somebody covering him and Wall comes back, Wall is nasty. He's nasty. The only problem is there is a little bit of an issue in terms of staying healthy for him. You've kind of seen these nicks you and bruises. You mean every Leafs goaltender yeah, seriously, in the last but, uh, seven years? The, the Leafs are fine. I just, I just kind of... I respected Sheldon Keefe. I know it's a tough spot, but he finally, like, after kind of bringing up that the team needed to be better in front of Samsonov over and over, finally, I think the other night, he said, this is the NHL. Like, we need a save. Like, they played great in Columbus. They, their offense was clicking, and he couldn't stop a beach ball. On the goal that Fantilli scores, it's, it's 35 feet away, no screen. It beats him. It's like... At some point, the coach had to be honest, and it, it sucks to do that, I'm sure. But he, he ended up saying, yeah, I, I think Brad Tree Living will do whatever he can to try to help us out right now because we can't, basically we can't continue to put him out there. Like I feel, I feel bad because he's lost his game. Like This is the confidence. And this, and this is when you go into uh, practice, and you're playing well in practice, and then you go into the game. You'll give up the first shot. It's like it doesn't matter how it's going anywhere other than the games. And for some reason, this kid, is not in the right mental space right now and can't figure it out. And the Leafs are kind of, at some point, have to be willing to say, all right, you're going to the minors. And you knew nobody was going to claim him. So now you just hope this hell to be. I mean, he's played, this is his first season in North America. He was good in Sweden last year, and he's enormous. But we'll see. You throw him to the fire, it's, it's the NHL, man. It's not going to be that simple, even though the AHL has gone well for him so far. The, well, the right only now, cons yeah. I got oh, the rumor boys for the Leafs. Oh, I was just going to say the only concern I have right now is this uh, we, uh, William Nylander rumor boy situation. And if it's any part I got true, rumor boys, and this is big time capital R, capital B rumor boys. Like, take this as serious as basically nothing. That doesn't make sense. Take this not serious at all. I've been told he was offered eight times 11.25, and he wants to take it, and his dad's telling him, you got to get some more. <laughs> Wow. Rumor boy stuff. Rumor boy stuff. That is the deal Pasternak just got. Pasternak is a better player than Nylander. Biz? Biz? You know, you know, the, you know, the, Net, you know the Netflix series that they do with the F1 drivers? They need to do <laughs> one on the Le Leafs. They need to do it on the Leafs' dads. Imagine Paul Marner in the mix. <laughs> Mr. Nylander. Let's get Poppy's old man in the mix. Pablo. I mean, at what point though? You, you know, you got to make your own decision though, as, as a man. You know what I, I mean? Listen, listen. I'm taking this like so not serious that this there's probably one percent chance. I'm putting it's stock true. in it, but but if they're offering them eleven times, uh, eight times, eleven point two five, the Pasternak deal, that that's insanity to me. That you wouldn't take it. That's why I don't really believe he's been offered that because Pasternak will Neil, Nylander's a great player. 
Pasternak's another level up. My opinion, I watched the games. I know this year, probably a lot closer. But prior history and past and like what Pasta's done compared to Nylander, if you're getting the same deal that David Pasternak has, you take it. You sign the fucking paper. Unless, Which is why course, I don't think it's true. Say yeah, that. Yeah. Well, so yeah, right now Toronto with Martin Jones and uh, Dennis Hildebay, and hey, Martin Jones, what he did last year for uh, Seattle, I mean, he kept that team afloat last year when they were going through some serious injuries, helped them get to the playoffs, so we'll see what happens with him up in Toronto. Uh, shifting over to the World Juniors, Whit, I know you've been back on the East Coast time and staying on top of this a little bit yep. more than us out here. What are you seeing? Uh, I know today uh, Slovakia got knocked out by the Finns in, in overtime. It was a bummer for me. I had a 50-1 to ticket on the Slovakians, but what's going on lately, Whit? It's such a fun tournament to watch, and oh, shucks, Canada lost. Now, I'll get ahead of this. I'll get ahead of this. If Canada, like every year pretty much in the World Juniors, if they had their actual roster, they're going to be the favorites. I think the only player that the United States is missing is Logan Cooley. Obviously, that's an enormous impact. This U.S. team's loaded, though, without him. Canada is missing a a boatload. And, I mean, when it's Connor Bedard being the main one, it's like it's kind of hard to chirp their junior team, considering I think there's probably five guys that would be on the team that 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 aren't aren't able to be there. Shane Wright could still be there, for Christ's sake. So an unfortunate loss for Canada. They never looked right all tournament though. Like I watched their games. It just and apparently like in reading online, they left some guys off the team that really should have been there. One of them's that Bradley Nadu kid from Maine who's disgusting. I don't know what the hell they were thinking le- leaving him off. Celebrini he did what he was supposed to do. He looked great. I mean, there was probably times where Canadian fans thought he maybe could have brought a little bit more. But overall, top-end player. And then this other kid, this um, Jagger Furcus. I guess he ended up getting brought over there after they lost to Sweden 2 nothing. But off the hop, they didn't take him. He's lighting up the WHL. So I don't really know what went down. The game against Czech today... Their goalie ended up making this incredible save when it was 2 0, and they went back down and made it 2 1, ended up tying it up. But the first two goals to go down 2 0 to check were kind of weak. One was five hole on the ice from the point, a little bit of a screen. The other one was a wrist shot that I thought could have been stopped. Kind of the same goal Fantilli scored on Samsonov, Columbus, Toronto game. Um, but, you know, even as an American fan who loves seeing Canada lose, I wanted them in the semis. You know, this U.S. team, though, it's got to be one of the best world junior teams they've ever had. Yep. They got they got players on up front. This Gavin Brindley kid is so good, so dynamic. Columbus stole this kid in the second round. Absolutely stole him. I don't know how he doesn't go in the first round. He's smaller. He's so quick. He's dynamic. He lit up Michigan last year. And somehow he's not picked in the first round. And Columbus gets him with his best buddy Fantilli going second overall. So that's a player I can't wait to watch in the NHL. He'll be there soon enough. But this Gabe Rucker Perot, McCoy, wait, what, what are your thoughts on you've Gabe been Perot? double wrist in this Perot kid all all week Dude, long? He's sick. He's, he's sick, he's sick. Eh? He is like the fact like the, this kid wasn't getting past Chris Drury, man. He got to New York in the first round and he was probably sitting there laughing. I got a kid with a hockey IQ like this with the genes of having a father who played in the NHL. So obviously he knows the game. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me with that hiccup. Um, <laughs> I think <laughs> like a- <laughs> I think when you have. Hockey IQ like this kid and the skills, it's just a no-brainer. Pick him in the first round. And Drury saw it. That that line from BC is a joke. Will Smith, the San Jose Sharks. Uh, Leonard Leonard is like, uh, Biz, who's he like in the NHL? He's kind of like a, like a TJ Oshie prime. Buddy, like a, that's like a good brick shit house. Like, like a fucking bulldog, dude. He'll run you over, plays on the inside. That's a vicious line that Boston College has. The fact they're lighting up the the world juniors and they're they're a college line. I have the hiccups now. If you can't tell, oh, you can't tell. <laughs> this is a disaster. This is an absolute disaster. <laughs> this is what they call the Zin hiccups. Occasionally, no free ads. Sometimes you put a Zin it and you get the hiccups. I'm going to talk through them and annoy every person driving <laughs> <laughs> driving oh. in their car. This is how much I love the world juniors. Rucker McGordy. Winnipeg's pick. I talked about him when we met him when he was Michigan. buckled at the draft, seeing all his buddies. This kid's a big old beast. He's a stallion, too. He looks about 6'3", jacked. He's the captain. Team USA, I love the fact that they will not play Sweden until the gold medal. I assume Sweden gets past Finland, even though Finland beat him in the... um. Or does US play Finland? Sorry. I don't know who plays who in the semis now. But I believe you'll see U.S. versus Sweden. Sweden's up right now against Switzerland. I think they take care of business there. 
the Swedish player I need to talk about. Holy shit, boys. Have you seen this Axel Sandin Pelica? Oh, what a name. Holy shit. He is a defenseman. First round pick by the Detroit Red Wings. They grabbed Uh-oh. another Swede Uh-oh. on the back. The eyes are plan. I said him. I said him in the pre before their tournament started. I said, keep an eye on this kid. He's going to be unreal. He oh, Scout dis- Grinnell. He's disgusting. He's got nine goals already this year in the SHL. He's going to probably be able to break the record for an under-19 defenseman goals. I think it's like 11 or 12. He might break the, break the points record that I believe um, uh, Victor Hedman had over there. It's like 21 points. He is a game breaker. He runs that power play, skates like the wind. Awesome. And Merle's actually interviewed his dad uh, right before the, this quarterfinal matchup. As Sweden goes up 2 nothing. there we go. This Swedish team, um, talking to Sean Horkoff, he's a Detroit Red Wings assistant GM. He's over there right now. He said it's the probably the best Swedish team, they, at least in a long time, that they've had at the World Juniors. And the fact it's in Gothenburg, the crowd looks nuts. So I oh, imagine if... How about, how about them inducting Hank, too, to open things up? Because Hank's from Gothenburg. So Henrik Lundqvist does a ceremonial face-off, gets inducted in the IHF Hall of Fame. Just an ultimate ultimate fucking put on a tee for the Swedes if, if you're telling me that this team's that good. They're awesome. And um, they got Nicholas Havlid, the former Atlanta Thrasher. He has two of his boys playing on the team against the goalie and a defenseman. So it's been a really fun tournament to watch. I love the World Juniors. Like I remember, I remember being 15 years old and like that was like I just want to play in the World Juniors. I want to play in the World Juniors. And now like I got the chance to play in two of them. One I barely played my first year in Czech. The second year I got to play a ton. We lost to Canada in the semis. Jeff Wawika broke our hearts. So now I'm always into it every year. I love seeing the prospects. I'm hockey DB and elite prospects the whole game. Yeah, I see a kid and make a nice play. Oh, who's this? Oh, second rounder. Uh, there's a kid from um from Czech that Vegas took in the second round, big center. He could be a hell of a player. Mike Johnson was talking about him today on the broadcast. But it's just a great tournament. I think I think fans love seeing their future players, and and I've had a blast watching. I felt really bad for Slovakia with an awesome pool round, and then they lost an incredible game. It was early this morning against Finland. They tied it up with like the minute to go and then lost in OT. But Slovakia, an, an amazing thing seeing what their programs turned into and become, and it's just awesome seeing all this talent out there. The talent is just it's gross, dude. It, I, I, after Riders games, I, you know, there's always games. Like there's a... Uh, 10 year old game after one of his games I'm watching I'm like these kids are so good I will say this about a lot of 10 year olds out there they don't pass the puck like kids don't pass the puck uh, like they used to I know that sounds crazy like literally every kid's like trying to go end end they're so skilled that half the time they can but it makes sense that moving up you see how good these kids are 10 or 11 now you get to world juniors you get to these 18 year olds in the NHL the talent is like nothing we've ever seen before and it's only going to continue to get better man and, and Wit, you mentioned Merles was getting interviews over there. We actually have a vlog coming out of Merles' time at the uh, World Juniors as well. So he's, that should... he's going to the game, Biz. He goes in the morning. He cabs over to the other rink. Then he cabs back to the first rink for the third quarterfinals. Then he cabs back to the, to the other rink for the fourth game. And he'll be at the semifinals and the finals as well. I guess he got a bunch of reactions from Canadian players. So that's tough for those guys. So it's uh, that, He loves I think the chaos be now. Play. He's the villain. He was just the getting villain. under the Canadian skin. Yeah, he was there at the live at the crime scene after uh, Chechnya. Is that how you say it? Chechnya? No, that's it's Chech Chechia, like Czechia. Czechia. I think it's Czechia, but they but most Czechs who reach out say just say Czech Republic. Still, I don't think a lot of them. Oh, like, really? Like che- Czechia, Czechia, Czechia. Yeah, yeah I don't. You're explaining. Well, Czechia is probably different. the wrong guy to ask. Um, <laughs> no. So I'll just no, say it's four different Czechia words. Czechia is a different country in a different part of the area. It's not yeah. it's Czech, not Chechnya. But Biz, what about civil that, war that, talk? What about that brutal call, dude? When they when they tossed out Con- Conagiki five five minutes in the gate, I mean that was pretty standard hit. No, a lot of people seem to think so. Uh, one of the funnier things that happens in the group chat is Army, who watches World Juniors and just bitches about officiating because you know Army's old school. Army was the guy who. Ar- Army was the guy where when the forward would come in his defensive zone and he would round the net, he would leave his weak side defenseman and come fucking put the guy through the end wall. So Army's maybe not the best bar to set as far as what should be allowed he for hits. He knocked out like not- seven people playing yeah, hockey with his shoulder. He might lead the league in knockouts in the history of NHL hockey. He's He was the Scott Steven of forwards, but you just kind of maybe don't remember. 
Uh, but uh, yeah, he was losing it. And then obviously we end up seeing the hit. This is off the opening puck drop, uh, less than 20 seconds into the game. Connor Geeky, uh, he ends up just making a beeline. Now, what flabbergasts me is the amount of dumb idiots online that will say, no, it, it, it is a dirty hit. If head was the first point of contact. It's like, this is like this is like lawyers reading the fine print and just trying to stir it up in order to try to win a case. It's like that is his fucking ice just as much as it is that German defenseman's ice. So the minute that German defenseman gets that pass and heads up ice with his head down and he exposes himself like that, he could just skate into him and put him into oblivion. The angle of his body in which the fact that his head's a little bit more forward, it's like, that's never going to change. That's how you fucking bend your knees and you skate forward. So where the fuck is he supposed to go? Do you want him to bend his knees even more? His elbow was right beside his fucking body and he laid him out with a clean hit and all these pussies online who want to change the way that hockey's played forever and change it into the and they say oh that's the way that it's officiated now it's like no that's the way that you want it officiated now well the like, iihf like does officiate like that i don't agree with it but it, it, you basically it is can't a, hit anyone it is a bit of a clown show and we know that international refing is a little bit more different but there's also a, a shortage of having competent refs and refs that have been in those types of situations and who have played at high levels i mean the nhl alone has a hard time finding enough of them who can handle that type of pace and have played at a high enough level to where they're not fucking blowing calls like that but that one was a fucking embarrassment and they had the ability to review it they did and they kept with their initial call so an absolute joke let's hope those guys got a talking to because if that happened in like a gold medal game and all of a sudden the team's short and then they go down a couple goals because they get this bullshit five minute major called on them absolute nonsense so let's hope uh, those i think guys the best aren't part efficient. was the slow motion like ge geeky runs him over the the whistle blows and he's just slow motion what the fuck for <laughs> exactly why is that a penalty and i felt his too frustration strong. So they, it's almost like these new school people who bitch about that stuff never want any type of onus on the player skating with the puck. Yes. It's just if you got it in the middle of the ice and you're in the trolley tracks, you're fair game, baby. Now, fortunately, he was not given any supplementary discipline. It was just that one game. So, uh, boys, I think we should probably uh, send it over to one of our two guests today. Well, what's up, Biz? Before we do, I didn't get a chance to thank the, the whole TNT staff for, for what they do and what they provide, like the, all the people behind the scenes setting up that the, the table that we sit at, all the shots, all the fun bits that we do. There are so many hands on deck, just like we talked about with the NHL, to make that thing operate. So I just want to thank the whole TNT crew. And we'd had a different producer this one because there was a, a you know, um, a family matter going on with our typical producer, Sean Gurjikoff, and we had to have another guy step in. So Liam, you know, took the bull by the horns as he always does, showed tremendous leadership and everything ran smoothly as well as, as Heitzy who, who stepped in as our producer. So just an incredible job by all the people at TNT. And of course it was great having Ace, Liam and, and, and Wayne on the broadcast as always. So shout out to them and, and thank you everybody for the, the amazing response to a great uh, fun show. Very accommodating to the Chicklets team as well, Biz. Uh, they make it almost seem like we're working at TNT too. So from from RA and myself, we want to thank them as well because they were uh, very helpful for us all weekend. They're the best. So great job, NHL, TNT, and uh, other than Bowie, everybody, uh, round of applause. We got to mention Jazz as well. Jazz always an MVP behind the scenes when we do this stuff. Yeah. Uh, also, too, the people at the, uh, the press box who took care of us the other night. want to thank you guys as well. But uh, now we're going to send it over to Montreal Canadian sniper uh, Cole Caulfield. And a little bit later, we're going to have uh, Canadian comedian Ian Bag. Going to mix it up a little for you. So enjoy Cole Caulfield. Before we continue, guys, I'm here to talk to you about Pink Whitney. Yes. If you're watching on YouTube, right behind me, Pink Whitney, New Amsterdam's own pink lemonade flavored vodka. I can't even describe to you how many pictures I was sent on Twitter of people giving Pink Whitney as Christmas gifts, bringing it to New Year's Eve parties. We saw all these different bars have all their different Pink Whitney drinks that they created for all the special New Year's Eve celebrations. <laughs> That's a hiccup. Thank you so much to everyone who has purchased the product, who enjoys the product. We got NFL playoffs right on the horizon. If you're going to a game and tailgating, Pink Whitney's your best choice, I believe, in catching a buzz and rooting on your favorite team. We, 
We got the national championship. That's another hiccup. And hiccups are not caused by Pink Whitney, so don't worry about that. That's my own issue I'm working out right now. But Pink Whitney is the drink of the winter. It's the drink of the summer. It's the drink of the spring and the drink of the fall. So everyone, go to your local bar, order a shot, order a little Pink Whitney on the rocks, order a little Pink Whitney with soda. Enjoy it the way you like it. Drink responsibly. Have a great time. Hand it out to friends. Check it out at liquor stores. Not too expensive at all. It's the drink of my life. And everyone listening, I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. So New Amsterdam, thanks to them. And thanks to all you guys. Pink Whitney's where it's at. Enjoy it responsibly. Enjoy it now. All righty. It's time for our next guest. This shop shooting Wisconsin native was playing for the U.S. National Team Development Program when he was selected 15th overall at the 2019 NHL Draft. After two years at Wisconsin and winning the Hobie Baker Award and a World Junior Championship, he joined the pro ranks and had 12 points in 20 games during Montreal's improbable run to the 2021 Stanley Cup Final. Additionally, he's 0-1 in sandbaggers. It's great to welcome to the Spittin' Chickens podcast, Cole Caulfield. How's it going, brother? Hey, guys. Good to be here. Thanks for having Glad me. Glad to have you. Sorry oh for that little God, dick. The Gotta Montreal fans are going crazy <laughs> right now. Crazy for the cock. <laughs> All right, did you know that this guy's nickname's The Cock, and you know who gave it to him? Uh, who, who, who exactly? I was, there. I was on the golf course. fucking Weber, one of the meanest guys Ooh. to ever play. We don't need to go into why you got the nickname, the but uh, <laughs> we can just leave it up to the imagination of all the, the listeners right now. So <laughs> it's great to finally get you on. And I think the last time when we had you in the bagger, you said, boys, let me get a few games under my belt before I come on and sling it. And hey, buddy, incredible start to your career. I think you were what, one of five Habs to score 60 goals before 150 games played. So congratulations on a great start to your career, bro. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> How are you liking Montreal? Like, is it tough to go anywhere? You're recognized all the time. Uh, what are your experiences so far in terms of living in the city? Um, I mean, it's been great. I think uh, I think I've lived three different places and um, not every place is, is a good time. There's There's always things to do, obviously. Um, it's tough with getting recognized kind of everywhere you go, but, um, you know, I think when guys come to the city, they, they kind of realize how special it is. And, um, I, I know all my friends love coming here as a, as a road team. So, um, a lot of good things to do here. Why are you moving around so much? Is it because <laughs> the, pa the paparazzi get you? <laughs> uh, no, I've lived, uh, I lived in two different uh, parts of the downtown and, um, I guess uh, you want to see some different, uh, not just stay in the same place all year. And, and right now you're currently living with uh, Christian Dvorak. So you're basically talking to yourself every day. All day. The guy's <laughs> a mute. Either, it's either myself or the wall. So, um, <laughs> yeah, no, he's, he's great. He's a quiet guy. Um, you know, we get along pretty well. I think I'm the energy and he's just, you know, keeping it low key. So, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. We have a good time. Cole, what did you know about the city of Montreal before you moved there? Honestly, not much. I never... I never uh, visited here for any tournaments or, or been here on vacation. So the first time I came here was was my introduction, and uh, it was during COVID, which you know was, was kind of tough. But um, these past couple of years have been pretty fun. I uh, learn any French at all? Uh, just a little bit. Um, don't it's, lie, it's, Cole. It's, you don't know any <laughs> French. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. No, but uh, it's uh, it's a tough language. They speak kind of fast here, so um, you just got to look up with bonjours. <laughs> Mercies, if you go on a mercies. date with a French girl, are you just what Google translating and passing the phone back <laughs> and forth, or what? Like, how does that all go? No chance. I think I'm I'm speaking English uh, as much as I can, and um, you know I'll learn sometimes. So uh, okay. we'll see. All right. Oh, buddy, <laughs> I, I, I'm curious about the season so far. First off, because. The expectations weren't high, at least from the outside noise. I'm sure you guys had your own ideas going into the season. But overall, I would say it's been a pretty good start. I, I don't know what St. Louis saying to you guys, and, and how's the team feeling as of right now as we come upon Christmas? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's uh, every year is new. Um, but you know, with Marty, I think you know three years in, um, we're starting to figure some things out a little bit and kind of getting the groundwork set. So um, it's been, you know, not right start. I think, you know, you always want more, but um, I think where we're at as a team and in the youth, um, I think we're all kind of finding ourselves and younger guys are, are starting to pull their weight and, and kind of figure things out. So I think uh, we're trending in the right direction, but obviously Marty and Ken and Jeff, they all have, uh, you know, the best interest in us. And, um, you know, I think we're, we're a couple years out, but, you know, we're, we're on the right trend. 
Does, uh, does coach have a little extra insight for you, Cole? You know, being an undersized guy like yourself. Yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously pretty special to to have that guy as a coach. I was pretty pretty shocked when it happened, and you know, Trevor was the first guy to tell me that he. I think he knew before anybody, and he he told me that uh, Marty was going to be the coach, and I just. I had to like stop driving and be like, what are you talking about? So um, it's obviously pretty special. Um, you know, he's, he's a teacher of the game. He's a learner. Um, you know, he has a passion for this, for this game and, um, you know, trying to figure things out. So it's, it's pretty fun. Obviously, you know, a lot of things I can relate to based on, you know, his size and, and the way he played, but um, just watching clips with him, it's cool to see. It's more of a discussion than anything, but it's cool to see just his ideas and what he thinks and, uh, it's more conversation than anything, but uh, a lot of teaching goes on. It's it's a lot of fun. Well, that clip went viral, right? When uh, when he was working with you, and I think you scored on the exact same play you guys were working on in practice. <laughs> I mean, th- th- that really amplified the conversation. So you're saying like what? Like weekly, you'll sit down with him with the iPad or, or the computer, and he'll talk to you about position. Is it just, like you said, more of a conversation? How often is this happening? Uh, yeah, once a week, probably minimum, I think. Um you know, every, every time it's, it's, you know, a couple of the same things or just reminders. But I think for me, it's, it's all about, you know, learning how to play without the puck. And, you know, we always talk about most of my clips are me without the puck and our rivals. And, you know, he always says, don't play on your rollerblades, you know, get shoes on. And um, obviously stopping and starting and, and finding timing is, is pretty special and important in this game. So um, it's more about, you know, kind of reading everything else on the ice rather than just the puck and, and where is it going to go and obviously just playing in the future. Cole, I saw an article in The Athletic. Uh, were you really skating at two years old? Your, your brother was skating a few years ahead of you. They took him, bumped him up to the next team, and you want to skate at two. Your, your mother wasn't too happy about it, but you were actually out there at that young of an age. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I don't know why she was mad. I was just out of her hands <laughs> during that time. So, um yeah, I mean, that's what they told me. I, I think, uh, you know, having a brother two years older than you is pretty cool. And um, you, know, you can always want to try and be like him or better than him. So we had a good relationship. But I think, yeah, it started pretty early like that or something. But uh, pretty funny. You know, you've played in the NHL. I think this is your third full season now. But what's been the biggest adjustment for you coming from college? And you've scored wherever you've been from the time you were, you know, a young teenager. But in terms of the NHL, the, the best league in the world, what's been the biggest adjustment for you or, or continues to be the biggest adjustment? Um, I mean, obviously, every team kind of starts to figure you out as you go. So you, know, you can play in college or, or junior and stuff, and you, know, you might not see the same teams or the same players every time you play. So now it's just all about trying to be consistent and you, know, you start to figure out teams and how they play and, and how you got to kind of change your game or, you know, your plan for that team, you know, every night. So it's, I think it's just, it's a lot to keep up on. It's, it's obviously a lot of fun to, to kind of find ways to get around that stuff. But um, I think consistency and just trying to be, you know, the best you can be every night. And obviously it's a tough league playing against the best players in the world, but um, I think just finding ways to, to kind of learn to beat, beat teams uh, in certain ways. And, you know, that's what makes it so fun. I was going to ask you about uh, the F1 this summer. Who'd you end up going with? Did you bring Zegras? That must yeah, have been incredible. Why are you shaking your head? I can't ask you about your was... personal life. You guys were putting <laughs> all over Instagram. <laughs> we, uh, yeah, I brought, uh, I brought the two right people with me. I think, you know, Jack and Trevor had a good time. Um, you know, it's, it's well liked by them. They give good ratings and uh, we had a great time. We also had Devo and uh, Chris Weidman were there too. So um it's a great spot in the summer i don't get to spend as much time as you know i wish here but um it's a lot of fun in the summer and you know f1's obviously pretty cool i heard that's why verbeek held back on zegris's contract is because he was hanging out with you at f1 i'm serious i get all the dirt <laughs> behind the scenes brother <laughs> what, are you, what are you laughing for i'm serious yeah probably was. <laughs> how but a serious question how how like how do you deal with the the media is it is it hard to leave it um at the rink when maybe things aren't going so well, like, is it, is it that amplified in Montreal or do you kind of block that out maybe during the season, no social media? Like how do you do it for as, as a young guy? Yeah. I mean, everybody kind of talks about it as, you know, you got to be there to kind of believe how crazy it is. And I think that's for sure. True. Um, I mean, it's hard to, even when you're not looking for it, um, it kind of hits you right in the forehead, whether you want to see it or not. So like, I mean, I think, you know, I went through a career a couple of years. You go through your whole career here, I'm, I'm sure. But, um, you know, Slap's going through you know, kind of a tough time right now. And the media's all over in one game. And then he's the best the next game. So it's kind of just like, but, 
you know, it's, it's obviously pretty special to, to play here where, where people are so passionate and, uh, you know, there's no other team like this one with, with the fan base and, and, you know, how much they care. So um, it has its ups and downs, but, uh, you know, you try to just stay away from that stuff. Has there been anything you've said in English that's been translated in French and you're like, no, 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 I never fucking <laughs> said that. Uh, nothing too bad that I've had to, you know, really, really think about, but, um, yeah, I mean, language barrier is kind of tough, kind of listen to their questions sometimes in English and, um, you know, some guys on our team are French and, and do their media in, in, uh, in French and it's, um, you know, it's a lot, but, uh, you know, they always ask you, are you learning, you know, are you, are you interested? Like, I don't know. It's, it's crazy here. <laughs> So when you when you went through that that tough time you were mentioning a couple of years ago and and they, and they sent you down and then St. Louis got the job but before even that down in the minors what were you telling yourself was there was there a kind of a a time of a little bit of depression when you got sent down you're a little bummed out or were you able to just kind of kick yourself in the ass and say all right I got to get going like take me through your mental state during that time I mean you're so young first year it must have been tough to go through Yeah it was it was obviously you know something that I never really went through um so for me, it was, it was something new and, um, you know, you kind of expect it when you have a goal in, in 30 games and in the start of the season when, you know, you just were at the Stanley Cup finals and the kind of expectations are still there for, for success. And, you know, I don't think I was playing my best. Um, you know, it's tough with a, a shorter off season, but, um, you know, I got sent down and, you know, I didn't really see it coming as much as I, you know, should have, but, um, you can't really prepare yourself for something like that. And, yeah, I just went down there with a good attitude. Obviously, um, you don't want to ever have to, to go through something like that again. And so that just kind of, you know, motivates me. And, you know, I think about that sometimes when things are going well, just try to work your way out of it. And, um, you know, you find success through failure. Cole, during that run to the, the Cup final, did it almost feel surreal? You were just in college a few months before that. Now you're, you're playing for the Stanley Cup. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, it was it was probably better for me. Um you know, you start to play in the NHL, you got so much emotion and, and juice running through you that you're just like, what's going on? But, you know, some of the playoff games just felt like it was, you know, your first couple of games. So you were just, you know, so excited. You didn't really think about the moment. And um, it went by pretty fast, to be honest with you. And um, just felt like one long season. I, you know, played college, the World Juniors, and then um, playoffs, which is pretty cool. So uh, it was a lot of fun that year. Uh, was it tough uh, maybe get motivated some games just because there was no crowd there? There was no, you know, cheer, cheering to get you guys up. How did you guys deal with that? Just be an empty stadium. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think I played 10 regular season games and you could just kind of tell, you know, the guys were, it was a long season, you know, not having fans and especially living in, in Montreal at the time. It was pretty tough with like curfews at 10 p.m. or you couldn't drive past nine. It was nuts. <laughs> but, um, you know, I got there and um, I was just, you know, so excited to be there, I think. You know, maybe brought some energy that the guys kind of needed and um you know, it was a lot of fun i think you know being with them and, and just kind of celebrating and just kind of hearing your teammates more than fans was, was pretty cool and you know again like i didn't get to see the real bell center until you know my next year so it was it was obviously pretty special um but you know your first couple of games and you know no fans it doesn't really feel real but uh, we went to vegas it was probably my first like real game with a crowd, and that was that's you know, oh. great. That's one way to start. <laughs> my ear still hurts from the national anthem and stuff, so it's just you know, it's nuts. We already had our flights to Vegas that year, and then you guys <laughs> ruined it for oh. us. Couldn't go to Montreal. Remember that? <laughs> bit? Hosed us, hosed we had us. our dinners planned, and everything. Merles was pissed, he was still ready to quit the pod. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, but hey, yeah. you grew up in Wisconsin, and obviously, Joe Pavelski's probably. I mean, if not one of the best known players from Wisconsin, I know Phil Kessel grew up there. But what was what was youth hockey like around there? I mean, I, I assume it's getting better and better. But compared to Minnesota, it didn't always necessarily feel like the, the same to me. Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, it was just you know playing hockey and playing baseball and football growing up. So hockey was obviously you my played favorite. football. Oh yeah. What position? Oh oh oh! oh. So like <laughs> yeah, like yeah. a dominant player Come by on, that on answer. That I'm guessing. Whip. <laughs> running back, right? Uh, it was like QB sneaks, and you know, there was I was running the ball. I couldn't see over the line, but I was just the fastest guy to get to the outside. Played uh, running back a little bit too, and uh, I like defense more. Uh, I thought that was pretty fun, but um, yeah, football and baseball were kind of my my two go tos. I love baseball, um, but yeah, hockey in, in Wisconsin's it's like you just grow up kind of playing with the same guys your whole start to your you know hockey career and. Um, 
you know, I think I won state five years in a row with my single A team. So, um, you know, I just had a lot of fun. I got to play with my brother a couple of years um, and play up with his team. But, uh, you know, all the kids just dream about just winning state. And I think that's what makes it so cool kind of there. I mean, guys obviously want to play high school and win state too. And that's kind of the main thing. Um, nobody really thinks about hockey as like a job or, you know, finding a way to play college. But um, for me, that was kind of my dream is just playing college hockey. And I think, uh, you know, playing with your high school team and going to school with them was a lot of fun. And uh, I think I, I played two years um, of high school hockey too in Wisconsin before the program. And um, got to play team Wisconsin on the side. So it was just, it was a lot of fun. Um, you get to play like in front of your school and stuff. And, uh, I think having those, uh, you know, things to go through and, and kind of just be around a team where, you know, the guys aren't really that focused on hockey as much as you and kind of just trying to drag them along. But, um, they're a lot of fun and, and I had a great time. So they do it. Do they do it like Minnesota where they do it in one spot where all the, all the high schools come and they crowd it up yeah, or is it a little bit different? Uh, it's at the old uh, Badger Rink um, in Madison. I actually never made it to state in high school, so I never got to experience that. It was uh, it was pretty tough. We lost an OT in my last uh, last game to go to state. So um, yeah, it's, it's it's pretty cool, but uh, it's not you know too big as Minnesota. I think Minnesota's got us there, but um, it's for sure growing. Did you always kind of dream as you got older of playing for the Badgers, where it was a no brainer once you started getting all these offers from every school? Uh, yeah, I mean. I, I don't even know what I actually committed to Ohio state first when I was like 14 and uh, <laughs> my brother was, he committed there like probably 18. a year before. And then, you know, I, when I first went there um, and it was on the table, you know, you're a 14 year old kid and you just went, you were at the football field and you're like, this is unreal. Like, yeah, sure. Like, of course. Sign and, whatever. Uh, it's like, but yeah. You're 14. I think um, it was you know, my, crazy. Yeah. You're like, parents get to, you know, have you go to college for free and you're just, you know, so wrapped up in that to play college hockey. I mean, I didn't know how good I could be or, or whatever. So, I mean, obviously small town kid from Wisconsin at 14, you're like, this is sick. Like <laughs> this is nuts. Give me all the gear or whatever. So, um, yeah. And then I think, uh, my, at the end of my or start of like my senior year, so 18 year at the program, um, no, I think it just like teams are starting to talk or like, see if you'd, Go to Wisconsin. I think, like, for me, it was a no-brainer. I just never thought, you know, I could have the opportunity or chance. And um, you know, once I they kind of started talking, I think it was for me a no-brainer to to kind of go play for your hometown team. So I keep hearing about these stories of of guys decommitting. Now, let's say that maybe things don't pan out from when they sign a kid out of the womb and at eight years old. They got these well, guys. They change the rule biz. So they can't. You can't commit so early anymore now. Okay, so what if if you commit, can a, can a team kind of decommit from you? Or if they want to do that, they still have to pay for your full ride? No, I, I think they – I don't know if they have to – actually, Cole, you, you might know better than me. Go ahead. I honestly don't think I know. I think they can Because <laughs> I keep hearing about you, you like, I think. players doing it. Like, can the school do it? Like, it's crazy. Yeah, that's true. I think uh, – it's not – I mean, nothing's official until you sign when you're um, yeah. 18 or, or whenever you decide you're gone. So – I think they have that right till you sign. Oh, okay. I think what happened was, Biz, one of the reasons they were changed, they changed the rule is that teams were offering kids and they'd commit real young. And then the team would be like, wow, he's not really kind of advanced and improved the way That's we thought. Right. Yeah. And then I don't know if they necessarily could have been like, hey, you're not welcome here anymore. But they could have said, listen, you're not going to play here. You might want to go somewhere else. So it, I think by delaying it, it kind of just it helped the teams not get left behind and the players not get kind of screwed as well. So... Makes sense to me, at least. Yeah. But, Cole, for you, I mean, you went to the USA program. I think it, it, you missed breaking Austin Matthews' single-season goal record by one. The next year, you smashed it. Was it then that you started realizing, like, wow, like, I, 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 to, to see what he's done and that I'm breaking these records, like, I have a chance to play in the NHL? Or did you even believe it a little before then when you were in high school in Wisconsin? I mean, honestly, I... <clears throat> I didn't really know what to expect. I was just pumped up to get invited to the tryouts. And, you know, for me, I didn't have a point in the camp. And I was like, well, I think I'm going to go play with my brother. Like, you know, I was like, this isn't like, I'm not making this team. There's so many good guys. And uh, I just remember it was probably the last game of the tryouts. And during the game, they like called my parents in and they told me I made the team. And um, obviously you have to go in there and accept it. And I didn't expect it. And I walked in and my parents were there and I was just like, thinking they were sending me home and um, 
it was just, it was John Robleski and you know, he's like, uh, congrats. Like you made the team. And I was like, kind of shocked for a second. I was like, really? <laughs> and so what? it was obviously, it was a pretty cool moment for my, for my family, you know, to have him be there. And, um, it was for, like a no brainer for me. I needed to, uh, you know, try and get out of Wisconsin and, um, kind of start my career. But, uh, funny story of, of Jack. Jack's like, you know, picking the team. It's his team, obviously, whatever. Um, he was in the office with, with Robo, um, you know, mid camp. And he, he's like, we're picking this guy and it's me. And he's like, what? Like, why? <laughs> so he's, <laughs> it was a funny story that uh, he told me after, but um, I think it worked out pretty good. Obviously, um, so many skilled guys, you know, you could have four power play units, but um, it was a pretty special team. We're still close to this day and, uh, you know, just happy to, I made the team. <laughs> did you know, like w- w- with Jack Hughes, did you, did you see this superstardom like that early on? Did you know he was going to be this good? Uh, yeah. I mean, like every day in practice you saw it. So it was kind of just like, he's on a different level and you know, okay. we all thought, we all thought we were good, but this guy was just, you know, <laughs> dominating. And, um, I think it was pretty obvious from day one, but, um, for sure. Like, you know, he's, he's grown a lot into his body over these past couple of years. And, you know, when I first met him, he was just, you know, a little stick like Trevor and, um, those guys really kind of worked hard to get out of that. But, uh, obviously Jack's, you know, one of the best players in the league now. And, um, I think it's just, you know, his, his expectations are so high for himself and, um, he's never really satisfied. So it's, it's fun to watch. How, how did he get to be running the show at the program, though? I mean, I know he's a good player, but he's fucking helping pick the team. Jack fucking Hughes. Yeah, maybe Quinn <laughs> Quinn helped him out a little bit. I don't know. These guys are hilarious. <laughs> uh, Cole, I know you, your dad helped you sh- to shoot right-handed as a kid. He, he felt it was better to, uh, to shoot on a goalie's glove hand. Were you shooting left before that? Could you shoot with either hand? Uh, No, like... Honestly, my dad has this crazy thing where he thinks lefties are, you know, able to score more with their dominant hand up top. And he likes right handers too. So uh, he's got this weird thing about it. But uh, I just remember he always tells me the story. He put when I was a kid, he just kept putting the ball in my left hand and like not my right. If it was in my right, he'd take it out. So I just like always, you know, play with the ball in my left hand. But, um, you know, I ended up being a lefty. And so um, I think that. You know, just had right-handed sticks growing up and, and throwing lefty all the time. I think it just all worked out the way he wanted. So, um, <laughs> obviously, he's, uh, he scored a lot of goals in college. Um, so, he kind of, you know, just taught me how to shoot growing up and never really, you know, talked to me much about it. Just, you know, wanted me to shoot pucks and, and make it realistic. So, um, he always made me do, a, like, this wrist curl thing before. Yeah, yeah. With the weight hanging and, down. How much oh, weight yeah, would you have on the bottom? Uh, Ten pounds. And I'm like grinding every night. I'm like, this is so dumb. Like, what's this going to do? <laughs> what about the rice bucket? Would you do the rice bucket one? No, I, I never did that. I think um, he was so into this this thing. It was just like, do it every night. I was like, no. <laughs> like, I had one of those and I don't know. I yeah. had a muffin. Yeah. So I could do anything. <laughs> I was strengthening my rest in other ways. Uh, but hey, <laughs> so you, you've always been known as a goal scorer. You said shooting pucks. Is that something like all summer long? You just been, you fire pucks, fire pucks, fire pucks. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I think I always just thought that was just the best part about the game. Um, you know, growing up, it was always like my brother was the passer and I was the shooter and I was okay with that. Um, but uh, I think, for me, it was just all about shooting in the summers or like making it so realistic. My dad ran a rink, um, and still does to this day. So it wasn't like I was shooting in the driveway all the time. So it was like always my brother and I kind of like making up things or, or kind of making it realistic. I wouldn't like just sit there and shoot a hundred pucks for no reason. Um, like my dad wouldn't even go out there with us. He just put up a shooter tutor and turned the lights off and said, you know, for your ice time, just go clean the bathroom. So um, he was all good like um coached me all the way growing up till i was about 12 and super hard on me hated it um but you know looking back at it, i think it's hilarious how many times a stick went in the stands during practice <laughs> so you would uh, so you would do a lot of situational like what, what like shooting while moving and i mean you had access to ice which is huge right not many guys have that luxury in the summertime so what types of of drills like helped you the most as far as the shooting yeah i mean honestly it was probably all my brother creating drills. He's kind of a nerd in that, in that way. So to have him like 
want to do it, I think I would probably just have went out there and, and shot Pox for no reason. But he had, you know, this mindset where he wanted to do all these things and, and be like his own coach. So I would just obviously be out there with him. And I was like, yeah, sure. Like whatever. And so everything we did wasn't just like stationary. I mean, I think we were, it was so nice to have like a guy out there like that to, to want to do that stuff. Cause you know, he would set it up, you know, pass pucks say, do this, do that. So, um, he was like my second coach growing up probably. <laughs> When you mentioned your dad coaching was hard on you, would he tell you privately, listen, like, you're my son, I got to be a little more hard on you? Or was it just rides home and you're like, oh, guess this is a, a no talk ride home again? Yeah, there was. Yeah, no, it was more like, he you know, never, I mean, he just likes to do it in front of the guys. Like, yeah, like, Chase, you're having a good game tonight. Like, you're doing well, you're playing hard. And I just, they'd just be like right in my ear saying it to him. Like, <laughs> what are you doing out there? And um, no, but he, he was good. Like, you know, he just, he was passionate about the game and um, still coaches to this day. So he just, he loves it. And uh, he's obviously just hard on us and, and wants us to do our best. Uh, Cole, I saw you the uh, fastest player in NHL history to get uh, seven o- overtime game winners. Did you always have, sort of raise your game late in the games or was that just kind of, I guess, luck in the NHL? Did you, you know, later in the games, <laughs> did you just sort of push yourself more? Because that's pretty impressive yeah, so far. Yeah, dad in his ear. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, no, I mean, it just means you're kind of an OT a lot, so. Um, yeah, you know, I think it's obviously <laughs> it's fun yeah. playing through round three and um, something that's new, and you know, you just get a lot more time out there. Obviously, playing defense is, is pretty tough these days against you know guys that are so dynamic and um, you know all the deacon skate that are out there. It's you know five minutes of chaos sometimes, but um, it's a lot of fun. I think I just you know I, I like being in those moments. Um, you know, it's exciting. Uh, they're close games. It keeps it fun and. Uh, for me, it's just kind of you know doing what I can to help the team, whatever. As far as guys uh, on the team, like who's been the who's been the most like influential on you as far as maybe off ice habits, uh, you know, training regimen, like just how you're handling yourself. Like who have you leaned on since you've been in Montreal the most? Would you say? Um, I mean, obviously we've had we've had a bunch of guys, and we got you know the the crew for for that playoff run, and then having you know Shea and Carey and. Eric Stahl and Corey Perry on those teams like it was nuts like just to see you know how much they dedicated themselves to the game for their whole career so um you know to to be in that moment with them was so special to see and just how serious they took obviously that whole season was was something special and it just you know put me in that mindset right away that you know I got I got to be like these guys um just obviously listening to everything they say seeing what they do it was pretty special but I think you know the longest guy I've been around the most probably is Galley. Um, you know, still to this day, he battles like he's, you know, he was earlier in his career, and um, the way he just does it, game in, game out, and just gives it all for his for our team. It's uh, it's cool. He's a great leader, and um, it's uh, it's for sure fun to be a part of. Speaking of old mans in in, in their ear, his old man's a mania. He trains with them. Have you ever gotten a chance to go out to BC and train with his father? <laughs> No, I've seen videos. Um, we'd always send each other videos back and forth uh, of working out. He's obsessed with, um, what's it called, like RDLs and all this stuff that's so bad for your back, but he loves it. He's a, he's a tank, but um, he'll send me like as many pull-ups as he can do, just a video of it, just to show me, you know, like what he's doing. I'm like, nice, dude. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> but I got to meet his dad this year on the dad's trip, so that was pretty funny just to see kind of all the dads and how they're you know, kids actually turned out just like how you can see it through them. So that's a good follow-up. I just want to ask, because when, when you went to college, I felt like it was more like a lot of weights and a lot of strength training. Like you guys, to, to some degree, were doing Olympic lifts. Was that the way it was in college for you? And did you have to kind of transform your your workout habits as, as you've gotten older and I guess as the games advanced? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I think I did crossfit which is probably not good for hockey Oof, players when i was like good. 13 and 14 i just not started good. and it was it was like new in wisconsin it was like cool thing to do so not good for you whatever for a hockey player um and then i got to the program and we were doing like all olympic lifts like like they've been doing since the start so our first year we had um just like every day the same thing cleans single leg cleans like you just couldn't feel your back but um <clears throat> it was just it was just normal like you just got used to it and it was it was good. Like, I think we did a lot of good training there. And then the second year, um, you know, it kind of changes around, you know, the new future of working out. I think it's, it's a lot more movement and, and be able to move power and in, in speed um, in, in the right way. And so I think, 
now my training, I've, I've trained uh, at the program still for the last like five years. So um, it's a lot of fun. I think, you know, obviously they know what they're doing there. Um, but working out for sure is, is something that's, you know, been more important during the year too um, that I've started to realize. So you kind of figure it out through through experience and um, I, know, I just find it, find it pretty good. And Gretzky was making fun of me. He's like, what are you training for? The Olympics? Because I told him we were doing power cleans and snatch. Were you guys doing <laughs> a snatch where you go overhead too? <laughs> Yeah, it was not like yeah. literally, literally over your head. Like you should have Silly. seen like Jack and Trevor and these guys do it. It was so it's hilarious. Yeah. What what about the you said the the CrossFit? What what were you doing in the CrossFit classes? Just all these crazy exercises, eight in a row, no rest. Oh yeah, blowing out your back like Gallagher. Oh yeah, just like Gallagher, AMRAPs like every minute on the minute. You're you're running, cleaning, pull ups like no idea what you're doing like burpees burpees were awful we had every friday we had to do 100 burpees as fast as we can and <clears throat> i don't even know what i was doing it was awful <laughs> i i think that crossfit is is legit like a big orthopedic like big ortho like they're in charge of crossfit because there's doctors who have jobs because people being so <laughs> injured from crossfit yeah, yeah like, big smart ortho smart won't let it go away <laughs> Yeah, yeah, smart move by them. It's like a dealership. They got the they got the <laughs> oil change, every tire rotation, everything's there. It's like they they set up the workout for, for you to fail and get injured so they can make money off your insurance or or, or out of pocket. Uh, uh, what about um? I, I I love watching Wi-Fi play. I know he's out out right now or or ha was out a little bit this year, but. What's he like in the room? Is he as crazy of a guy as he seems on the ice when the wires cross, or is he pretty level headed? Like, what's his deal? Uh, I mean, he, we could call him the sheriff. So like, he's, he's like, he is just on the ice, like kind of the man, um, you know, thinks he's the man he just comes <laughs> in. Like there's no scare factor for him. I mean, what are you going to say? The guy will just kill you. So, um, but no, he's a good guy. It means well, um, you know, loves the guys is he's a really good, really good kid. So, you, so he's always got the game face on you guys try to rib him about it. And he's just, you, you can't get him to crack a smile. Oh no, the guy's the funniest guy you'll ever meet. Like joking with everybody, chirping everybody, just so loud, obnoxious, mullet. Like the guy sideburns, it's crazy. And like the guy's hands are the size of a house. It's not like so sausage fingers. Not. I think his brother's now a part of your organization too, right? Yeah, yeah. He's uh, seen Hamilton. I, I don't know if he's in Hamilton right now, but I remember hearing that they signed him, and he's he's a killer as well. I'm like, oh, geez. yeah, yeah. I saw I met him at camp this uh, this year, and um, same thing. Just got that tick in him. That's just schizo. It's crazy. So you, <laughs> you you guys have a lot of personality in that room with Gallagher. My understanding is when you came in, like you know, you weren't exactly the quietest rookie either. <laughs> Did anybody have to put you in your place because you're you're in the room first game, just buzzing around, chirping guys, laughing, big smile I, on your face? Yeah, man. I don't I don't even know. Like I think I was just so excited and like these guys were just like so cool to me that I was just pumped up to be at the rink every day and um kind of hit it off the top right away. And then I think my first after my first game we were in Calgary, so we flew back, had this long flight and like Weber texted me. Like, come to the back. What are you doing? And like, <laughs> like, oh God, what's happening? Like, I'm in trouble. What are we doing? And um, just, you know, kind of had a couple beers on the way home and um, just heard some stories and, and talked and just, you know, it was cool. Like, didn't touch my phone for like five hours. It was awesome. Like, just listening to these guys. You're just entertained. And um, I don't know if I, that was probably the longest I haven't talked for. So just listen to those guys, I think. Um, you know, just like their energy, um, try to keep it light, and you know they had fun. Go. Cool. What is that? Sean Monahan brought to the team. Uh, one of the <laughs> older guys. I know he's not that old, but what has he brought to the team this year? Um, consistency and like this guy, he's been doing it for ten years, and you don't even realize, you know, how long he's played. Um, but just you know, he's gone through so much injury wise that you know it's a lot on him. But you know, he comes into the rink every day, like first guy you see working out. Um, just doing all the right things and <clears throat> he's been so good for us down the middle um, this year and um, obviously he's been through so much so uh, honestly one of my closer friends on the team and um, one of the funniest guys on the team too like you probably won't won't see that from the outside but the guy's always cracking jokes like leaving fruit and guys 
pockets <laughs> on their jackets, like anywhere. It's nuts. It's so funny. The team uh, prankster. He, him, he's, he's got it. He might have it. I mean, Galley's obviously, you know, going crazy with the, that stuff, but um, he hasn't done anything in a while. So hopefully it's coming. Um, <clears throat> one of the topics of conversation that's come out on the podcast uh, quite a bit and wit, I mean, you could vouch for it. He's talking about the U S and how the development program and just how hockey's grown. Do you guys talk about that amongst the guys and, and where you're now competing with Canada, where you guys seem to be neck and neck? Is that something you guys are talking about while you're training in the summer and like keeping an eye on all that? Um, I mean, I really, I think, you know, we all just, know all the Americans in the league and how good hockey is growing in, in the U S but um, for us, you kind of just look around and you're like reminded of how good, you know, like these guys around you are that are American. I think um, it's obviously pretty cool to see. Um, but for us, it's just like, I stay close with my age group and those guys and into Hughes and stuff, but um, you know, it should be fun if that, if that does get to happen in Canada versus U S thing. And um, I think that'd be pretty cool for the, for the league and for fans too. Why do you think the, these guys have gotten so good? Like how, like, how, like, I mean, you're around them all the time. These guys have popped off to where, I mean, you could, you could argue that between Quinn and Jack, they could both be up for the heart this year. And Luke could be running for the Calder if it wasn't for, for Bedard and he still is in the race. Yeah. I mean, obviously that family's created three beasts and, um, <clears throat> I think kids growing up just kind of want to be like those guys in the younger generation. That's fun to watch. Um, exciting. And, you know, all these younger guys are, are finding these new moves or, or crazy things. And um, I think the, the compete factor for, you know, kids growing up is, is getting better. And I think, um, you know, looking at guys like Jack Quinn, um, you know, Kyle Connor, honestly, was amazing this summer that, you know, I just, you get to see the talent um, on the ice, obviously when you play them. But um, for me, all the, all the guys we skate with pretty much are American and, um, they've all been so successful in the league these days and it, it's fun to watch. Uh, is there anyone else um, besides yourself? Because I'm guessing a lot of the guys training at the national program are from Michigan, so they're going home. But are there guys from Wisconsin or other states that are actually training there all summer too, like like yourself? Um, Jake Sanderson um, moved out for the, for the summer. Um, most of the guys do live around the area, which is pretty crazy. And... Um, <clears throat> It's kind of nice to just, it's a pretty sick group. Like you look around, you're like playoff team for sure. Like <laughs> hella buck in that. And you're like, we got, we got this. So, um, I think, you know, just being able to play at the program and live there, I, I kind of liked it right away. So being around that area, it's, it's great in the summer and, um, obviously pretty special to have all those good players around. Uh, Cole, your, your coach at Wisconsin, Tony Grano, had to step away from his TV duties. He, he announced that he was sick. Uh, have you talked to him since then? And what did he mean to your development when you were at Wisconsin? Yeah, obviously that's you know really tough news to hear. Um, you know, for a guy like that, um, obviously great guy and, and mentor for me growing up. But um, I learned so much from him. My two years with them, I think you know, it was taught me more about life and taught me those skills with hockey involved. And I think it just kind of clicked for me, you know, how much he cared and how much his passion is for team first and kind of just wanted everybody to be the best they could. And, um, you know, just to see something happen to a guy like that, it's, it's frustrating. And, um, you know, I, I texted him the other day and, you know, he's, he's ready for the fight. There's no better guy to, to take something like this on, but, um, you know, he did so much for me in college and, you know, I can't thank him enough. Uh, you know, he'll always be probably one of my favorite coaches, if not my favorite. So, um, you know, he's been unreal for me and, um, you know, saying prayers for him, obviously going forward. Absolutely. Who was your, uh, who was your idol growing up? And, and I'm guessing if you don't say your dad, you might, you might catch a slap here. So <laughs> <laughs> no, I just see, like, I never got to see him play. Like he didn't, there's all these VHS tapes and like, he's I like, saw just a trust highlights. me, bud. just trust me. Yeah, I was like, sick. <laughs> you're not even moving. Like, what are you doing? So you know, I just sit there and score. But, uh, oh, my favorite probably growing up was we, my dad was an avalanche fan. So we'd always watch, uh, you know, Joe Sack, you know, started it, but I really liked Matt Duchesne growing up, to be honest with you. He was, he was fun to watch. They're always on. And, um, you know, obviously Patrick Kane, you kind of fell in love with too growing up. So that's kind of cool. Um, he's obviously grown so much of the game in, in America and, and done a lot for the league. So, um, I think everybody says that obviously Crosby, Ovechkin, those are guys you kind of idolize, but you know, we were so, 
lucky as kids to have so many you know different uh legends to look up to what are you watching for television shows <laughs> like the season can get a little bit monotonous and you, you can't really do much outside of your home in, in montreal like do you watch a lot of tv uh movies i mean not really like you kind of find yourself tired all the time like or you're hanging out with the guys playing cards it's like Usually when we're home, there's a, there's a game on or, or hopefully it's a night where there's football. So um, haven't really got much into shows. I think my my team's talking about squid games right now, the the real one or whatever. But uh, I don't think I can watch that. I think that somebody won and they still haven't paid them. That's really? the last I heard of it. Yeah, that's what, I don't know. I just kind of follow on Twitter and on, on online, right? I don't, I'm not much of that's a show true, watcher. Biz. That's confirmed. <laughs> yeah, it was like, tw- what what'd she win? 26 million bucks? I think it was four four point six five was. The yeah, I just made that I number up in my head. Wait, what do you uh, mean they haven't paid them? Uh, apparently, they just haven't paid them. Like they filmed the whole show, the person won, and then they just like she can't yeah, secure Netflix her bag. Hasn't paid him, wait, Netflix has to pay the winner, and they haven't paid yet. Now this, wow. this I, I'm prefacing this as possibly one of my dumbest questions ever, but there was no like death in this real game show correct no no there was they were oh, just shit, okay, murking fair, okay, people cool, left cool, and right cool. that's why the tag was so high on them that's the why winner. they haven't got paid because they're missing <laughs> yeah. a couple of arms so well, they had like... to pay a lot, yeah a lot of families off for <laughs> all the bodies uh, buzzing around call it uh, entry level deal it's not exactly chump change but when you signed your extension last summer did you treat yourself to oh, anything baby. nice no, maybe oh yeah the, <laughs> like, the cock what the cock buy <laughs> 56 like, million <laughs> honestly like nothing i think the only thing i did i i paid for a taylor swift party bus and that was kind of that was fun so oh i mean nice honestly like nothing really yet um you know you don't really know what to do it's it's life-changing and um i think just you know you're kind of shocked to look at your bank account sometimes but um you know you try not to think about it but uh you know people around you remind you all the time where was Is where it- was the concert well, I was just trying to ask, are you like a known Swifty? Are you like loud and vocal about that? Like, not really. I think people just took it too far with the 22 thing. Um, obviously, I think, you know, she's got good tunes, but um, I'm not really listening to Taylor Swift all the time. But I mean, you, you, but you just, you got a party bus to her oh. concert? Yeah, I mean, yeah, she's going to be like, on it, biz. <laughs> it's, it's like a once in a lifetime thing. Like, she's like iconic legend. Like, you got to see it once, right? And he how didn't pay was for it? the tickets, Biz. He just paid for the bus. <laughs> oh, okay. So it was nice. It was Did nice she invite us. you herself? I mean, was this before Travis Kelsey? Was, <laughs> was this like a, a fling going on? No, no. So, no, it wasn't wasn't like that. But, um, no, I just honestly wanted to go myself. So, uh, you know, I got some friends to go. Jack and Trevor were out. They didn't want to go. But, you know, I thought oh. it was great. Are you a big concert guy in general or just because it was Swifty? Uh, country concerts for sure. Um, that's about it. Who are your guys? I like that Zach Bryan guy. <laughs> yeah, he's he's obviously been unreal this past summer. Um, like Wallen, um, to go to, but you know, all country music's good. You getting tired? Are, are you cooking at home? Are you out to dinner every night? Like, what's the meal plan like there? <laughs> um, I mean, Devo doesn't cook, so uh, <laughs> doesn't do anything other than doesn't play hockey. do any, doesn't move. Just what does he do? Couch. What, like what would you say that Christian Dvorak's main interest is other than hockey? Uh, Sleeping. Cards. Sundays, Sunday football. Sunday well, football. For Sunday football. You, he, his go-to is he doesn't watch Red Zone. Well, he, he has Red Zone on one TV. We have two TVs hooked up. So he's like, you won't miss a snap. Like, that's his go-to. He's got two remotes. He's locked in. But. Is he following the Pinto parlays? <laughs> <laughs> not, not in Canada. No. Oh, no? Oh Canada. yeah, that's right. You can't gamble so, other than Ontario, yeah, which is it's, it's where tough. Pinto was. Yeah, so Sundays aren't, aren't really as fun, but um, our fantasy football league's pretty good. Do you guys have rookie party yet? Uh, we did. Where was LA. it? Oh my god! Ooh, yeah, oh, Jesus. We didn't really have put it together for you this year. Um, <laughs> Pearson lined it up though. He's a great guy. <laughs> oh yeah, he was the, he was there. Yeah. Rookie parties are the best because you see you see some guys that you would have never thought come out of their shell come out of their shell. I mean, it would have been fun to see Christian Dvorak maybe do that. But I can yeah. remember our, ours. We had one in L.A. and uh, we had Damon Lankow on our team, and he was just you know straight and narrow. You know, always looked the grumpy, just came and did his business. And 
you know, I never forget where it's probably one thirty, two o'clock at the rookie party. And I look up and next thing you know is, is Damon Lankow. He's got a foot on each speaker <laughs> in the top ropes. He's got a bottle of Grey Goose in each hand and a cigarette and he's smoking out, out of both hands. <laughs> so like it's just like the rookie party who who is probably the one guy to come over to shell the most this year at the rookie party there's always stories the next day um honestly justin Barron was probably the best he was dancing singing um doing skits um but uh he's pretty funny man like guy pretty quiet you know off the ice and you know to see him in that kind of scene it was pretty funny kind of for sure out of his shell that's usually at the restaurant, right? Where guys have to get up there, tell a joke, you know, do a little skit. Wait, did you guys have to do that? Um, we had to tell a joke, my rookie party. Um, and then in the middle of Scuderi's joke, John LeClaire, I think, said, Scott, shut up, go sit in that bowl of ice cream. And then he just... <laughs> Or that was Sid. Sid sat in the bowl of ice cream and then Scuds ate the ice cream later. Oh. That's what happened. <laughs> mm. <laughs> But yeah, we had to tell a joke, and no matter what, you're not getting a laugh out of anyone, old school style. Who t who told the worst one on the team where he got the booze and they they pigeon tossed him? Uh, Probably Slavskoski because really he can't. I think. <laughs> <laughs> can't speak. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, he obviously he's pretty tough to to hear when he speaks English. Um, it's it's funny, but uh, none of the guys this year had had bad ones. I think it was it was all funny. I think guys are. Sometimes too comfortable with their jokes, but it it's always gets laughs. <laughs> I, I mentioned you won the Hobie Bakerwood back in 2021. Were you nervous going into that? Like, did you think you were going to win? What was your mentality going into that announcement? Um, honestly, it was, you know, you got to golf that day. So I was pretty pumped oh, you up. You got to bring like three guys and golf. So I had a great day. The day went by pretty fast. And um, I was more nervous for like to give a speech if I won. So you know, you had to prepare that and, and be ready for it. But that was probably the, the scariest part. What was the celly that night? Uh, I think the college club in, in Minnesota. <laughs> Good spot. Go. I thought that was, I thought their spot was the library. Wasn't it called the library? Maybe uh, when I was there, that's what it was called. I don't know. I don't know. What's the, the, bar, what's the awesome better. bar at, 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 in Madison? College club. Or college Wando's. Club, college club. Yeah. College club is nice. Good spot. Right. You have been checking out a lot of the spots in uh, Montreal, maybe in the St. Catherine Street area. Kind of famous <laughs> ones there. <laughs> I mean, the restaurants Where's are that? incredible in Montreal. <laughs> like yeah, the cuisine I, there is I, nice. I, I saw it on the internet. <laughs> Great food. Great food. I haven't been to a so bad here. restaurant. <laughs> all right. All right. All right all you guys got? Shit. Yeah. We the appreciate cock. this, buddy. Uh, <laughs> the cock. We appreciate it, and the rematch I've, will happen. I haven't got the, called that in three years. Well, you are the now, cock. buddy. Every fucking <laughs> paparazzi fan is going to be outside of your apartment is going to be calling you, oh, there's the cock. The cock of the walk. Uh, all right, buddy. Good luck the rest of the way, and we appreciate it. Big thanks to Cole jumping on with us, a little uh, alumni from the Sandbag Attorney. Nice to catch up, chat with him for a bit, but uh, we're going to send it over to Witt. I know there was something you wanted to discuss from things over the weekend, pal. What's going on? Yeah, I briefly talked about the Kaprizov brendan Dillon thing at the beginning of the show, and on uh, Saturday night, they played in Winnipeg, Minnesota, um, versus the Jets. Who, who, it's, it's a pretty cool little like division rivalry they got going. They're both pretty tough teams, and... And in that game, Kaprizov, he's, he's got it down low, and he's kind of fighting off Dylan. And Dylan comes at him. He hits him with the perfect Peter Forsberg reverse hit. Puts him right on his ass. We've talked about Dylan a lot. Big, mean, tough customer. And in the end, like after he gets up, he ends up going up to him. And just, it was a cross check, and it probably could have been a penalty, but it injured Kaprizov. He had to leave the game, and he wasn't able to play the next game. Now, people, Minnesota fans were flipping out, like talking suspension. It's like, it wasn't even close to that. It was a pretty normal cross check. Got him in the right spot. Actually, Ryan Carter's on the broadcast talking about how he wears an extra pad there from trying to, like, save him from some of those rip shots you can get. Well, it, it, it missed the pad. It got him. So it injured him, and uh, he couldn't play the next night. Well, the next night, they're playing a back-to-back. -back. They go back to Minnesota. That was actually Fleury's 1,000th game. And right off the opening bell, dude, Pat Maroon fights Adam Lowry. A great way to start the game. Pretty good tilt. And all of a sudden, like, you see, like, this Winnipeg team, this this wild team, they hate each other. They're in the division together. It was an awesome way to start it. And I, I guess it probably stemmed from what happened the night before, even though it wasn't Dylan fighting. But 
in that game, early on in the game, Nemestikov is taking a faceoff against Hartman, and as the puck gets dropped, the ref kind of blows it down quick and says Nemestikov cheated, and, and Hartman didn't do anything to him because the puck was actually dropped. So Cole Perfetti comes in, and then right off the draw, Hartman just sticks him right in the face with a high <laughs> stick. Ended up getting fined. It was, uh, it was bad. It was bad. It was blatant. He got fined 4500 bucks, whatever the max fine oh, is. Oh, peepee whack. And um, he told. Now, Perfetti didn't tell anyone this on the team during the game. But Hartman out on the ice told him, hey, that, that one was for uh, that, that cross check on Kaprizov last night by Dylan." So apparently, like, he tells the media after this, this is Perfetti talking, and then all of a sudden bonus is asked. He's like, we didn't know that. Things would have been handled a lot differently, but I wanted to get your opinion, Biz, on like the fact that, like, hey, you take out one of our best players, I'm going to stick you in the face, even though you had nothing to do with it. That's kind of that old school mentality. Yeah, old where, school. Where, where, where some skilled players used to back in the day, I'm sure, be like, oh, fuck. Someone's going to come after me now because this game's gotten out of hand. I didn't even do anything. But I, Hartman's a dirty little like scumbag player that you want on your team. And yep. I don't know. Like I don't know what to say about I, it. I, no, I, I mean, I'm not going to condone sticking a guy in the face because obviously the result could be uh, catastrophic. I mean, we had uh, Terry Ryan talk about the one where it was an accidental where the guy ended up losing his eye, right? So so if you're a, if you're a Jets fan hearing me talk right now, I'm not going to defend what the actions were. But I can't sit here and tell you that I don't love this type of mental warfare where, oh, yeah, you want to go after our skilled guy. I'm going to go after your skilled guy and 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 the onslaught will continue. And it's yeah. kind of like you're going to if you guys want to be a bunch of fucking idiots, you're going to reap the punishment of it because I can't get to that guy because Hartman's Hartman's not the type of guy who's going to go after Dylan. He has other guys on his team who will handle business with Dylan. But knowing that it's like, hey, man, we're we're all in this together and I'm going to be cheap shot in your skill guys now and and going after uh, low hanging fruit, as they say, I I love that shit. And if Hartman was on my team, and 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 the the only bad part about it is, and you might have already mentioned this, Hartman was the one wearing the wire, or was it Perfetti the one that was Perfetti. wearing? A, I think Perfetti, Perfetti was, was. Perfetti was wearing a mic, so there's like video or, or audio evidence of him saying that to them. So maybe next time you do it, don't tell him why you're doing it. <laughs> Just do it, and and. He might Leave not have up. got fined if the audio wasn't there. Because, because, because if anything, the word, the 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 threat of the unknown is what would eat me alive. Like getting that and wondering why I got it, and and then now you're sitting with those thoughts is is worse than him being like, I just stuck you in the face because of what happened to Kaprizov. So but I want to. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, I like ahead. how you. Well, I just I like how you brought this all up because because Minnesota is a team that's going to be trying to claw for a wild card spot. I would imagine and. Winnipeg has now built this culture, which seems like I don't want to say it wasn't like this last year because they still had guys like Dylan and, and, and Lowry and guys who would stick up for themselves. But it's evident that this is becoming a boys club who believes in one another and they're galvanizing even more as a group, especially with Rick Bonus under the helm and the, the call out that came after last year's playoffs. So this is the big bag Winnipeg Jets. I don't know how many people had that on their big old card this year, and I love every fucking minute of it. And right back to Minnesota as well with that type of culture in the locker room and probably a big reason why they brought Patty Maroon in in the offseason as well. And, and as the Winnipeg Jets dream season goes on, what happens? Lowry fights, fights Maroon off the opening drop. He then scores a goal. Lowry gets a goal. And what happens? Perfetti gets the high stick, goes to the bench, gets fixed up, gets a big assist on the second goal of the game. So it's like this team is doing everything they need to do. And actually, I think right now the Central is the only division where you could say the top three teams, those will be the top three teams at the end of the year. I think the Atlanta is such a – the Atlantic is uh, such a crapshoot with – I mean, the Metro is such a crapshoot with Philly still holding a spot. Can that continue? The Atlantic, obviously, you got Toronto, you got the um, – Panthers, who knows who's going to be the top three there. The Pacific gong show, what's going on out there. But then the Central, it's Colorado. Right now it's Winnipeg ahead of Dallas, and then it's Dallas. Those will be the three teams getting those auto bids from that division, and I think you could seal that one up now. But what a season the Jets are having, and it's, it's great to see how tough they play, how much they stick together, and then that they got hella buck. It's, it's the recipe for, for a surprising, no one saw it coming besides Army, possible cup run by the Jets. 
And uh, I don't, had we talked on the last podcast about that amazing comeback by the Arizona Coyotes on Colorado? And we, we'd already talked about that? No, no I, I think I that don't, happened, happened after yet. we recorded. No, it happened. Oh, game, no, it. game notes discussed it. We, we didn't. We we went back to last podcast trying to stroke off McKinnon and, and, and the good things that Colorado has, and then we also talked about the things that they don't have going on. Devon Taves, who called out their team, things are things are a little shaky in that locker room. I think that would be my prediction on what's going on, and 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 obviously the call out speaks for itself. But to go into Arizona after that call out and have something like that happen, there's a massive disconnect between the core group of guys there and the layer of guys that need to get on board if they have a, a sniff of winning a second cup in this little kind of what you would think would be a dynasty stretch for the Colorado Avalanche. Like everybody thought after they won their first one, if you could have bet if they would have won a second one in the next five years, I think most people would have taken that bet. Right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. With that, and score, and yeah. right now, right now, you just said it's kind of up for anyone's grab to win that division. But those are going to be the three that are solidified. I don't. I, I, I right now, I would pick Winnipeg Jets in a seven game series over the Colorado Avalanche. That's well, where I'm I, at. I will say that they blew that game, and you saw um, Gorgiev flipping out after Gorgiev. Uh, Gorgiev flipping it. out, but. They went on the road and they had a huge game and, and held on for a win right after that against St. Louis, two to one. So at least you're seeing a response from that sure. complete meltdown that they came back. And I think that was actually the game that ended uh, McKinnon's um, point, point streak. Point streak. Point streak. Um, but but you know for him to end that point streak and for them to still get the win after blowing that game, it showed some resolve at least. But I know what you're saying. Uh, but it's hard to be really like critical while they're leading the division and and have us right now the NHL's MVP and McKinnon blazing around out there. I feel like it's pretty simple. They just they're missing Gabriel Landeskog in that locker room. Like oh, he, he, you know, your, your captain, captain is and 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 uh he would he would kind of be a bit of a diffuser in a sense of how quick quick wicked McKinnon is and maybe how he responds when when you know he's a very intense guy. He's got that Jordan Jordan S to him, right? He's fucking in guys' faces and, and a little good to, cop, bad cop biz. Little good that's what they need. Maybe just fucking bring him in between periods just to shit sit there in his gitch and, and, and be around with the boys. No? Did you ever have that, that wit? A guy a guy that. that provided that much leadership? Just sit in your gear and then when we come in, you can just act like you've been playing and then we'll go back on the ice and you I can mean, chill. He's, He's making seven million. I think it's the least he could do. <laughs> There's a big comeback like that to where they uh, was any streaking going on on campus after the big comeback there. <laughs> but I'll just say, I, I was very pessimistic about what they were doing because I wanted them to to try to get another high draft pick with the amount of talent that was in these neck. Like you know, we went back to the Bedard draft, and then this year they're saying that there's a lot of highly touted prospects. So I wanted them to tank. But gee, you said it. You said I love what these guys are doing. I love what they're they're doing. There's a fucking chance that the 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 Coyotes end up getting a wild card spot. And if that is the case, Tourney should be considered a top three candidate for the for the coach of the year. Yeah. Right now, though, I think it's easy to say that we got Torts, we got Talk, and then who would you I mean, who would it's you guys? Hard not to say Montgomery again. I, I probably wouldn't say Montgomery again. There's but if you got one. it last year, they're like just as good, and they lost yeah. Bergeron and Krejci. Three T's, though. Torts, Talk, to Rigney. I certainly yeah. would, wouldn't if, disagree. A, if Arizona three. gets in the playoffs, there's no doubt he's at the Torts, Talk, and to Rigney, the triple T. I like that, all right? That should be yeah. the three right now. I got money on all three of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm rooting for the, the checks now, but I still got, I think, a 16-1 a to 1 ticket live on the checks. I had 50-1 to 1 on the Slovaks. But so you're rooting for the nice. checks over the U.S.? Um. Well, I'm just rooting for the checks to win the tournament money wise. I mean, oh, we'll see sweet. what happens down the line. So, <laughs> uh, wait, we're just talking about Minnesota. We got to give a shout out to your former teammate, Mark Andre Fleury, played in his 1000th NHL game. What a fucking hell of an accomplishment. He's got 550 wins. He's only one behind Patrick Waugh. He had a nice little prank Waugh. I mean, obviously, he's well known for them. Him and Brandon Duhame, I guess, I don't know, I think. Uh, What's his name? Flurry hit his shoes or something. So he had to wear these like white fur boots. He looked like something out of an Usher video. And then he had he put a cane. Duhane put a cane on um, 
Flurry's net so he was playing with like a fucking cane during practice. Like he's he is good at giving the pranks whip, but it, he loves getting them as much. As, he seems like he enjoys getting pranked as much as he loves. I doing don't the know Brandon Duhame, but I'm telling you right now, you ain't gonna win this one, bud. Like this is not the guy <laughs> you want to do prank wars with because he won't sleep at night until he thinks of another one to embarrass you. I think he took his shirt at one point to so Duhame's coming up to the game or leaving the game with no shirt yeah. under his suit jacket. Um, the cane one was pretty good though. Of course, Flurry ends up sitting. And they're making saves in practice with a cane as a stick. <laughs> so, I mean, Fleury's just an incredible character. It's like on the ice, he's had this amazing career, Hall of Famer, no doubt. But then off the ice, everyone who's ever played with him talks about how great of a dude he is. He's laughing, he's smiling, he's fucking with people, he's screwing with people's dads on the dad's trip. There's no end to his madness in the prank wars. Yeah. And so to see him play this long and be this good still is great. I think it all started when Duhame chirped his age. I think he said, ah, oh, it's pretty impressive yeah. what he's doing for a 50-year-old. And that might have yeah. began at all. Oh, I don't know yeah. if it had already been going on. He's a, he ain't going to retire. He's going to come back one more year just to <laughs> torture this guy. And I, I would just use the word special because I think that any time a guy who has had that successful of a career yet maintained like how classy he is but yet still found a way to entertain people through any type of the social media or any of these media requests and showing his personality i think that's one thing that that the hockey world and the hockey players might get criticized for but I can also understand where, where guys have so much pressure on them making all the money and being the stars to perform on the ice where maybe they tend to be a little bit more reserved off. This is a, a star in our league for so many years that provided entertainment not only on the ice but off the ice as well. And you know, I've done work with the NHL on the social media side and they said like he is one of the easiest, if not the easiest guys to work with. So for him to kind of carry the weight on in all of it, He's just a, a special guy, and and I believe he's a Hall of Famer. And I think that that is that kind of an obvious statement. Yeah. He's a Hall yeah. of Famer. He's going to be he second fir- all time in wins, right? All right. Uh, he's going to be yeah. His next win will have him tie with Patty Watt for number two overall. So um, also the coolest thing looking back is I mean the greatest draft in the history of the NHL, two thousand three. Yep. Yeah, you're first welcome. Pick. He was the first pick. So You're it's welcome. amazing. Like I feel like a lot of guys in that draft could have been like, holy shit, what a disappointing first overall. Look at who was after him. And when you look back, it, it really wasn't because of what he's done. So he's lived up to the expectations. It's incredible because he's lived up to him. Crosby's somehow lived up to those. Malkin's lived up to him. And you know who else has lived up to everything, even though he was a second rounder? Chris Letang. Oh, did you yeah. see what G's Walmart Eric Carlson did the other oh. night against the Islanders, boys? Wow. Five apples in one friggin' period? Unbelievable. Uh, put up the most points by a defenseman in a single period in NHL history. He assisted on five straight second period goals. Uh, the only other player with five helpers in a period was uh, the late Dale Howachek back in 1984 for Winnipeg. Uh, Latang assisted on his sixth straight goal in the third period to tie the NHL record for assists by a D-man in a game. Uh, the last defenseman to have six assists in a game was Gary Suter way back in 86. And uh, shout out to Gino Malkin. A uh, pair of goals. He passed the great Sergei Fedorov and is now second uh, all-time NHL goals by a Russian. So uh, your old teammates still getting it done there, Wood Dog. It's, it's especially unbelievable. That, and it's just that the disrespect version. from G going into the season. Oh, chirping, chirping. I, I can't hear you guys. Wi-Fi in and out. <laughs> Wi-Fi oh, yeah, going yeah, in and out. Just talking about the Chris Letang like he's Ryan Whitney skating around for the Penguins. I mean, it's it's. I actually wasn't watching the game, and somebody sent uh, Biz. I think you were on the tweet, too. Like, did Chris Letang just have five assists in 10 minutes of game time? I was like, what the hell? And I went onto the app thinking that it would be a broken NHL app mistake for, for standard, <laughs> and it wasn't. I was like, holy shit. He's snapping it around in Long Island. So the Pens it are reca- try- His game recalibrated the app. It's actually fixed now. <laughs> so thank you to Chris Letang. And uh, in terms of Penguins news, they're getting um, they're getting Russ back, who's been away for a month, who's been an awesome player ever since he's been in Pittsburgh. So it's, I feel like they've been better lately, and they're still, I think they're seventh in that division or sixth in that division. It's like, it's just so hard to make up ground, and Carolina's Tough. getting going a little bit. Aho. Yep. Aho went on a tear. I think he had eight points in about an hour of, uh, hour of <laughs> ice time over two games, or less than an hour. So... That division's impossible to, to predict, but the Islanders took a beat down at the hands of Latang, the, the Walmart Carlson. And uh, yeah, Friday night here in Emerald City, uh, John Tortorella became the first U.S. born coach to reach 1,500 games uh, 
Eighth overall to hit that number. He's in his 22nd season with his fifth team. 723 wins, his 10th all-time and second among U.S.-born coaches. Uh, he's right after Lavi. He's made the playoffs 12 times. Uh, Jack Adams awarded 0-4 in 2017. So uh, Torts keeps getting it done. And also Paul Maurice, he hit the magic number 1,800. Uh, just the third coach ever to hit that number. Uh, Scotty Bowman first, Barry Trott second. So congratulations to those guys. Those are huge numbers, very impressive. And I just want to give a little uh, tip of the cap to those guys. And boys, I, I mentioned we had comedian Ian Begg. Uh, if you haven't heard of this guy, absolute character. You should probably check him on his material, but we're going to send it over to him right now. So enjoy. All right, before we go any further, here's a few words from our friends at Sport Clips. Your hair may grow fast, but after going to Sport Clips haircuts, you wish it grew even faster. That's because Sport Clips has the best seats in here. And that may or may not be because they happen to be right in front of TVs playing sports all day, every day. We know that watching sports while getting a haircut sure beats watching Reflection getting a haircut, which is why at Sport Clips, every day is clippers and curveballs, high tops and Hail Marys, and even waves and wickets, if you're into that kind of thing. At Sport Clips, you can check in with the pros and men's hair and totally check out with pure, uninterrupted relaxation. So yeah, come watch an endless stream of sports on TV while getting an awesome haircut. Sport Clips, it's a game changer. Okay, it's time to bring on our next guest. And we got a little something different for you today on Spit and Chicklets. Hailing from British Columbia, this comedian started off in his home country, eventually made his way to New York City where his career really took off. In addition to appearing on Last Comic Stand and in several late-night talk shows, he's also had specials on Comedy Central, HBO, and Showtime, among others. We're very happy to welcome to the Spit and Chicklets podcast, Ian Bag. Thanks for coming on, pal. How goes it? Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Oh, man, my hockey career is finally maxed out. I'm on Spit and <laughs> What do you mean? You got a hockey podcast. I just found out about that, too. Yeah, I got a great podcast. It's fantastic. No, it's, it, we have a lot of fun. I grew up in uh, Terrace, British Columbia, and one of my friends uh, played in the league, Jeff Sharples. And uh, we just talk hockey and where it takes you through your life, you know, because it doesn't matter what <laughs> level of hockey play you play, you still end up with hockey people no matter what, right? So yes. were you playing at a young age? Oh, yes. Yes. I've been a donkey since I was about three. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I, I was at your show in Boston. It was unreal. I, I didn't oh, know thanks, what man. to expect because I hadn't seen you prior. Just torturing torturing people on the show and that's before i went in there i talked to scott darling i, I talked to avery who i know you, you know both those guys pretty well they said guy. don't go near the stage this guy will carve you up i sat in the back just trying to stay out of the stay out of the light of getting tortured by you but has that always been your thing like almost it said there isn't like a monologue it's like a dialogue with everyone the entire yeah. time yeah it's kind of like uh, it kind of grew into that when i first started out as uh, i was i was influenced by a huge boston guy Stephen wright so oh, was, the best. The yeah, best. So I, oh. I, I was very one liner and I, I spent a lot of time with Mitch Hedberg. Uh, we, we started out together. He lived in Seattle and he'd come up to Vancouver and we'd go do these spots. And I had long hair and looked like a <laughs> loser. <laughs> he had long hair and looked like a gorgeous rock star. And we just do, we do these shows and, and I would do a little bit of crowd work every so often and it would just, it would just kind of grew into this monster that it is. So. Uh, do you find that maybe being in the hockey locker room made you quicker on your toes? And that's why you were so good at picking these people out of the crowd? Not so much the locker room, but sitting on those little buses when we were kids. Like it was just, you know, we and, and I'm old enough. We didn't have any entertainment. We our our, our video games were those uh, those 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 video games that were just lights. Like you'd play baseball and go blink, 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 blink. <laughs> <laughs> little metal battery, battery ones within, yeah so the battery would kill it within like three minutes of being on the bus and now we're just staring at each other ravi chokar's dad's sitting in the corner drunk and and just watching us so, so we just started making stuff driving up and, the bus yeah <laughs> driving the bus i feel oh, like you man. and ra are going to be relating a lot to all these uh. old school video games and anything going on probably before me and Whit were born <laughs> Yeah, you right? guys, you guys, you guys who have no idea. There were lights in video games. Yeah. Yeah. Back in the day. <laughs> oh, it's a battery. <laughs> what, like what, what gave you the balls to start doing stand up comedy? Cause I, like, I mean, wit RA, I don't know if you guys would ever have the jam to get up no, there. No, too. Oh, haven't me. yet. So probably it's not. It's a different, it's a different beast. And, and it was awesome to see, see uh, Scott Darling 
uh, do it yeah. as well. But like, how did you get your you start? What gave you that little little jump to even get into it? Uh, it's it's what I want to do. I grew up uh, uh, listening to my uh, parents' albums. Like, uh, uh, there was it was Bill Cosby. It was just oh. talking about comedy. <laughs> All right. Do we have to police out that down name? Now? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Holy Would shit! Like Instantly go to look. I love Bill Cosby. <laughs> 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 no, but, but he used to he used to he had these albums and he'd paint these pictures with his words and i could see everything he talked about and that's that's how i wanted to be i wanted to paint pictures with my words so uh it was i don't know but i grew up in the middle of nowhere terrace british columbia so you go you're, if you're in vancouver you drive 12 hours to prince george you take a left to prince george go another eight till you hit prince rupert and then come back an hour that's terrace Oh my God! Holy exactly. shit! Yeah, oh, that nice. and that'll that'll that, that'll fire them up. It's not that far. It's not that far. <laughs> I'm like, yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, it's a hike. I believe we call that isolation. Yeah. Is uh, is yeah. where that is. There's actually quite a few. Uh, well, I mean, for the size of it, uh, quite a few NHLers that came out of there. Yeah, a lot of them. Yeah, there's Jeff. Um, there's a, it's a couple of tough guys came out of there. Rudy Pocheck came out of there. Mm-hmm. Uh, he used to just smash everybody's face in town, and then he decided he had to go to a bigger venue. <laughs> so, so I would assume at, uh, at growing up, you were a Vancouver Canucks fan. Would you get down to yes. games? Yeah. So, so when I grew up, again, I'll relate to RA rather yeah, than yeah. Talk, my, just talk to RA after we yeah, ask you guys just sit around and watch you play your, your, your video games. Uh, <laughs> so we we got cbc where i grew up we got cbc ctv when i was really young so we got mostly toronto games but every so often there would be a vancouver game and i saw a different jersey and i'm like this is awesome so i became a a vancouver canuck fan and then i realized even though i was nowhere near vancouver i realized that was the closest place that had a hockey team so then i started getting the uh every year shoppers drug mart would put out a uh, calendar with the team on it so i had the team you know uh, in in the house and marking off the games and stuff like that so like even though we never one guy dressed as a fireman or something like he's got the the tarps off like one of those types of calendars (laughs) wasn't a sexy calendar (laughs) (laughs) one guy just sprawled out on the beach oh i love it i love 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 it to trevor linden (laughs) this that goes exactly so were they being sexy You got the oh, whole rat man on. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. Just, just yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ian, That's how old eight. were you when you said, I want to be a comedian? I want to do this for a living. How old were you? I was, uh, I, I was quite young. I was probably 15, but I just had no idea how to get there. Right. So I, uh, my mom's from Australia. So we'd live in Australia for a little bit every so often. Mm. And when I was 17, when I finished high school, I took off to Australia and then I ended up back in Terrace. And I ended up with a job working for an explosives company. And I started off right at the bottom. I would just be the guy that would carry the explosives into the, into the truck from the magazine. <laughs> Fourth liner. <laughs> They're like, be careful here, Ian. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, like, what was it like growing up in Australia? Like, uh, I mean, you know, not every it's, kid gets to experience that. It was hot. It was great. It was fantastic. There was beaches. It was there was stoplights in the towns that I was in. It was crazy. It was it was we were in Sydney. When I go over there, we go for periods of time and we'd be in Sydney. And, and then I come back to this little town in northern Canada. I'm like, oh, I got to get to the city. Uh, the city's much better. And I, 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 I have no idea how my dad tricked my mom into going to this little cold village in Canada. So yeah, it was pretty great. But uh, yeah, yeah. So I was working in explosives. I was going to take off to be, to become an engineer. I wanted to learn how to uh, do implosions. I want to learn how to take buildings out of cities without ruining other buildings around it. That's what I wanted to do. And uh, I ended up doing an open mic night that had a contest. And I was so green. I had no idea. Like, I had my jokes written on my hand. I was so nervous. I sweat them off. So I had nothing on my hand when I went to look at my hand. So I ended up doing impressions of fish with my hands. <laughs> I didn't win the contest. And I thought, well, that's it. I gave my, I gave my shot. I guess that's show business, you know, because I, where I was from, show business was basically, basically an Archie comic where a limousine just seen you walking down the street and said, that guy's funny. Get into show business. But uh, the guy, so I thought I, I'd done my due 
And the manager of the club just happened to see me walking out and he said, Hey, you should come back next week and do it. So I came back the next week and just, that's how it started. So, and I never went to school. <laughs> that was it. That was it. And then I was in, I'm like, I'm in, I'm bit. Well, well, I read one thing that I think your history teacher, when you were young, said to your parents, like, is there something you need to tell me about Ian? <laughs> What's wrong with this kid? <laughs> That's it. So I had this history uh, teacher, Henry Dreger, and he was a little boring. And uh, we used to sit at these long desks, like almost tables. And I used to pretend that I was Paul Schaefer. And he'd, he'd ask me a question and I'd always answer, with, well, Dave, and I'd pretend to play the piano. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> I should have probably been in a special needs class. <laughs> take the short uh, bus here, Ian. Late night monkey cam. <laughs> you say you take the short bus. So you, I drove you must it. have been a big Letterman <laughs> fan then. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, so, geez. what would you say your biggest, like... What made you explode? Because when I saw you, I think you mentioned like the, the amount of uh, social media f followers you had exploded yeah. over the past two years. Like, what was it that happened that that made you finally blow up? Uh, honestly, I saw I've just I've been I've been doing comedy for about twenty five years, and in December of last year, I kind of fired everybody in my camp, and I just kept one person. And then I met this kid who was about twenty two years old, who knows social media. He said, let me cut your, your clips and put them online. And I couldn't believe it. It's just, it's just gone insane. It's gone, it's gone on YouTube. It's gone from 5,000 followers to about 230,000 followers. Right. So and that's, that's since January and it's 130 million views this year. So it just kind of started filling up the rooms and adding people come in and, uh, you, uh, YouTube, uh, Facebook is up to about 400,000 and it's just, People, people are just coming out of their woodwork that just want to have fun, escape for an hour, and not take things too serious, which is my style of comedy. Yeah, that's huge. Um, as like, and no offense, like as an older guy, was it a little bit uncomfortable at first? Maybe Bring getting speak into, up. It, was it a little <laughs> uncomfortable getting into the social media world with your comedy? And I would say Absolutely. that probably yeah, most comics don't want to put their material out there because you want to waste it. But the good thing is, is you're doing crowd work, so it's all different from night to night, right? It, it, that's very true. Like it, when, when I started doing comedy, you saved everything. You didn't show anybody anything, and then you got on a late night show, and then you showed five minutes, right? That's how it was. So my generation or whatever group, we, it was very difficult to let things go. But I had heard a long time ago a saying, those most resistant to change are the first to be left behind. So I just like, I guess got to give it up. I just got to do it. And what I've learned is the new style of comedy is just putting it out there. It's not, there's nothing to save it for, right? So if you're a good comedian, you just put it out there and then Netflix comes and says, do a special and you can write an, a special. You don't have to save that stuff. You just put it out there. That's going to find you people. So it, it was, it was tough, but it was, it's freeing to me. Like I just put, you know, just put stuff up now, just whatever. We just keep put stuff. So, so it's almost similar to what we've words. talked about with viewership and sports that younger kids and the younger generation just wants clips and then boom, like that's yeah. kind of makes sense in term, terms of why you exploded. But how long was it until you were able to like make it your full time occupation? Like you're you're working side deals, and side gigs, and, and and you have a main job, and then at some point you were like, all right, I can go all in on this. That must have been so relieving for you. It, actually, it wasn't. I never, I never really did the relieving thing uh, until this year. This is this is the first time okay. I've ever actually been relieved. I've always been like edge, edge. Okay, here we go. Even though I've been making good money for years, it's now. I feel comfortable, right? So uh, I stopped doing any sort of side job when I moved to New York. Is when it was when I when I stopped needing to make more money than I had, right? And then now I'm an actual business. That's the difference. I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense. Like, no, it no, does. It does. Oh, yeah, because uh, it it's kind of like sports. You can make money, but it can end tomorrow, right? So you got to be careful. Because a certain amount of money doesn't last for longer than tomorrow. So you always got to be, you kind of have to be edgy, right? And you have to kind of, all right, all right. So uh, try to figure things out. Yeah. Every comedian says, 
whether it's once or several times, like you bomb. And and do you Actually, remember your first time? I remember my I remember my last time <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> that's every show. Uh, but yeah, every you can show, just carve like, everyone if they start booing you. So yeah, like that's yeah. a win. Yeah, I just snap on them. I snap. That's on how he yesterday. sets them up. He just starts bombing. He just starts going at people once they start yipping. I just start taking it down right into the mountain, and then I just pull it back. Right, 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 right. no. <laughs> uh, I remember the first time bombing. Uh, I was at Yuck Yucks in Vancouver, and this is when I was first starting out. I did. It was the first time I did their room, and there was like twenty people there, and they were just staring at me, <laughs> just staring. And it turns out they're all from Switzerland and don't speak English. Oh, you know? <laughs> I'm like, this is great. You have a guy a warning that's just starting out in comedy. No. Um, bombing can be freeing, to be honest with you. It's pretty amazing that a group of people can agree that they don't like you. <laughs> that quickly. <laughs> that quickly. That quickly. You're like, ha, huh, just by walking to stage, you can tell you don't like <laughs> Oh, I uh, looked at your face and there was something about it. Yeah. Some of the way your eyes sit on your face do not make me happy. So uh, I was just going to say cr doing crowd work, though, can be a little dangerous if you start going at the wrong guy. Have you ever had any instances where security had to oh, get yeah. involved where you're just car carving a guy up and oh, he's got yeah. some liquor courage and attacks the stage? I had one. I was in Texas. I was in uh, Arlington, Texas, and um, there was this fella and he was on a date and he was. I don't know. It's a pretty big room. It's about 350 and he's probably about, you know, 250 in and he's a, just like Bill, like, you know, just a mutant and he's on a date and I go, I said, what do you do? And he said, I'm a gang banger. That's what he said. Right. And trying so to be he, the comedian. Was he trying to be the comedian? Or was he trying to be tough? Right. Is, is, yeah. So I said, either way you got him. Right. I said, there's two types of gang banging. I know. <laughs> <laughs> is it, the is type it, I'm into and <laughs> right, yeah. is, it, is, it the, is it the shoot shoot or the fun one <laughs> and he gets up and he chucks a rock glass at me right just like and this is a big boy and I can see it coming at me and I step to the side and it hits the wall behind me which is made of brick falls to the ground and doesn't break and I just hear a bunch of people go like they made fun of him <laughs> For not breaking the, the glass against the wall, right? So I said, hey, man, less shoulders, more squats, right? And he got up and he ran out of the building. Now, he said he's a gangbang. So all I can think is, well. And you're in Texas. Yeah. Yeah, he's going out to get a gun. That's what yeah, he's going to do, that's right? That's what I thought where he was going. Exactly. So, and he's on a date. And he runs out of the building and, and there's bouncers there. And I go, where'd he go? He goes, he got in his car and I'm like, okay, this is where the gun is, right? <laughs> and he drove away, left his date, right? And I said, and she just didn't care. I guess it wasn't going well or, what, or whatever. And then it just got worse with me talking to him. And he drove away. So what kind of car? And they said, a Porsche. And I said, what color? And they said, purple. I said, that's sad that he couldn't even get the color he wanted. <laughs> <laughs> so, but he didn't he didn't come back and, and kill me which was 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 great about it but i insisted on walking to the hotel that night i don't know what it was about my machismo but i'm like he's probably out here waiting for me but i gotta walk there if i'm gonna die i'm not gonna be in a shuttle on the way to the hotel <laughs> that is so good uh, hey, and i, I, mean, I want to ask what did like crowd shift from going like oh we're going to a comedy show you, you might hear anything you might be offended to like oh my god this is offensive i don't want to hear this like there's been a, a huge shift in that has there not I don't know. I don't know if there has been, you know, it's, I think there, the shift has been now that it's online, people see it. Like I, I remember having a lady yell at me once that I did comedy wrong because of the way I did it. I'm just like, how am I doing it wrong? She said, you're not taking it serious. I'm like, you do, you do hear what you're saying, right? Like people, people are, are going to be offended no matter what you have to be yourself. I think I talked to Paul once about this. You're going to offend people no matter what. So if you just do you, it's better. Like if you try to be something else and then you still offend people, you feel like a piece of shit afterwards because you weren't true to yourself. So you just might as well offend and just get the people that enjoy you. As crazy as that scene was with that uh, juice monkey you threw the glass at you, I would imagine that's probably not your craziest interaction doing stand up. Is there anything that's even wilder than that? I would imagine like, I don't know if you're married or not, but probably some good looking girls maybe reach out to you after the show. 
No, uh, good looking oh, okay. girls do not like okay. comedy. <laughs> Ugly ones? <laughs> That's Ugly ones? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, when, I, when I was single, I, 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 if I can suggest to anybody, do comedy, travel the world, and get yourself a French bulldog and just nail everything, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I want to ask. I, I, you're, as old, we're the same age, basically. Like the yeah. first wave of political correctness, I think, was like the late '80s, early '90s, and the pendulum swung the other way. We started getting like you know gross movies like American Pie and stuff, right. and it's come the other way, way, way toward the left. Do you think it's going to like fully swing back the other way, or are we going to be stuck on this like side for a little while? It's, um, it's, it's a weird time. I, I think it's. I think it goes like it will go back the other way. And I think it's starting to a little bit. There's, there's been some like Kreischer's movie was hilarious. I don't know if you've seen the machine. Uh, it was just, it was offside. It was stupid. It was, it was drug filled, sex filled and just escape is all it is. Right. So I, I don't know. I don't, people have to get back to the point where do you want to be entertained? Right. I'm not trying to teach you anything. I'm not trying to give you any morals or anything. I'm just trying to entertain you. And I'm trying to make you laugh at stuff that you never thought you'd laugh at, right? So you can, you can, you've made your decision when you've walked in, in the door of a club or walked into a movie theater that you want to see something that is going to entertain you. So either go along for the ride or don't go, don't get on the ride, right? I can't help you. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what people's lives are that want to complain about everything. Like they just want to, they want to be offended. I don't, I don't know what that, what it is. So. Well, at the show I saw you, you were, I think you could be described as offensive as shit and people loved it. And we're in Massachusetts too, where people are super left-leaning liberal. And I was like, this guy's unbelievable. He's going at everything and everyone. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. And people loved it. They didn't give a shit. So maybe you're right in terms of people seeing it online that weren't actually in the building. They're the ones who get rattled. Yeah, it, it, there's definitely... Um people that check they want to see comedy you know on your settings i want to see comedy and then they see comedy and they're like oh, i didn't want to see comedy <laughs> i didn't sign up for this <laughs> yeah so so yeah there there are those people out there it's 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 just it's weird right it's, it's weird people are weird it's a weird time you just want to have fun so i i don't i don't, I don't care like whatever whatever ian one of the more fascinating things i read was uh you've met three american presidents Yes. In your lifetime, have you performed for all of them? And which ones did you end up meeting? I haven't performed for any of them. So are you sneaking into the White House? Like how well, the fuck are you get into it? Well, well, I have been to the White House. Once I was doing a show in uh in DC and this guy came up to me afterwards and he goes, You want to go to the White House tomorrow? I'm like, All right. He goes, Well, give me your uh give me your driver's license. I'm like, Okay. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm that stupid of a guy. I'm like, all right, here's my ID. Where's my money? Um, but he turned out to be the uh, Marine Guard, Marine Honor Guard that is in between you and the president. So he set me up to just go on a tour of, of, the, of, the, of the White House. It was crazy. It was, I'm just like, I'm walking around. He goes, hey, can you put on a collared shirt, though? <laughs> so I had to put on a collared shirt to go to the White House. It was a little disappointing. Who, who was in uh, power, I guess uh, you could say, then? Bush was in power. But George Bush, too. And while I was there, there was very much security around the bathrooms. This is a great story that I've never told. I don't know. If they, I don't think I've told this on anything, but uh, they had a poop smear in the White House. Somebody was using one of the bathrooms, and after every time they'd use it, they'd wipe poop on them. <laughs> they what? So they'd, they'd wipe their poop on the walls of the, uh, of the bathroom in the White House. And this was before That's, Biden was what? in office. What the fuck are you talking about? Somebody sh smeared shit in one of the bathrooms yes. on all of so the walls? They would have, they had like at least six cameras. And I'm not going to say if it was a boy's or a girl's bathroom, but they had at least six cameras pointing towards this one bathroom. Because I asked about it. I'm like, well, why do you guys have so many cameras on the bathroom? I'm like, who's weird? That's a little weird. And, and they told me. They said, hey, yeah, we got some, we got a poop smear. <laughs> Inside job. Who, Inside uh, job. Who, uh, what other presidents have you met? You really want to know about these presidents? Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I, I think it's pretty fascinating. No, it's fucking. It is. It is. It is. Fa so, uh, so when I, I, so uh, as I've said, a hockey, hockey has been a through line through my life. So um, when I first moved to LA, I wasn't as busy. Right. So I helped coach, uh, like, a, a 16, 17 year old hockey team, 14, 15 year old hockey team. 
in Burbank. And one of one of and it was all rich kids. And they they used to wheel this guy in every so often. And he would watch and it turned out to be Reagan. So that that was that was one of them, right? One Reagan's grandson played hockey on this team. And they said, that's Reagan right over there. That was, so that was one. Then another time before he was president uh, with Obama, I was on a plane with Obama. I sat behind him <laughs> on a United plane. And that was before, obviously before he started running. So he had to fly coach as well. It wasn't like we were both in first class. We were both starting our careers. And then another time I was on a plane with Carter and that was coming out of Atlanta. And I remember he walked around and shook everybody's hand on the plane. Hello, hello, I'm Jimmy Carter, Jimmy Carter, right? And they had to make an announcement. If Mr. Carter would sit down, we could pull back from the gate. <laughs> I loved it. And there's one, there was a lady sitting, sitting to a, above me and she goes, Mr. Carter, you're the greatest of all times. And there's a guy beside me goes, easy. <laughs> 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 that was so much fun. I was like, oh, I'm like, oh. doesn't matter who you are, you're going to get chirped no matter what, right? Oh, yeah. 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 Doesn't matter. Ian, when you, when you were making your bones in New York back in the like, mid to late 90s, who, who other guys were coming up with you? Like, uh, like uh, guys who I guess are famous now that you might have. Uh, Absolutely. So I remember, like, so how I ended up in New York was I was at the Montreal Comedy Festival. I wasn't on it, I, was, I went to see my friend on it, and then I ended up on some shows. And this guy invited me down to New York and I took it at that age. I should move to New York. So I took $700, moved to New York, lived in a youth hostel, ended up getting sets at this place called the comic strip. Uh, I used to have to go, it used to be, um, it'd be Chappelle, it'd be Chris Rock, um, Ray Romano, um, Red Johnny and the round guy. I don't know if you remember them. Uh, all these huge names, Dave Attell, uh, Louis CK, and I would always get the check spots where that was the new guy's spot where you just, the checks would be paying, being paid and you just eat shit for like seven minutes. It was fantastic. So, but I just kind of grew out of that. You just either, either, either built your skin or you just left the business. Right. So yeah. Gaffigan, right. Gaffigan and I used to hang out all the time back then. We used to get the same spots. So. Is is it a competitive industry or was everyone very willing to help each other out? Everybody's with buddies or, or is it a little hostile in there with the, maybe some of the egos? No, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very, we'll all help each other out until you get something and then you're a fucking asshole. Yeah, <laughs> okay, <there> he, <laughs> he fucking yeah. sucked anyway. Well, he made it. Let's try and tear him what, down now. What a douche. I can't yeah. believe he's doing it. So, yeah. <laughs> fuck yeah, your sitcom, I, bitch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody yeah. we do we yeah guys help each other out all the time yeah because it's just it's you don't when you first start out you get to hang out with your buddies more as you grow you're on your own running around the world right so you don't get to see your buddies so it's 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 kind of hard we try to we try to make it so we can get back to that point where we're all being stupid when we started out so when was it when you got on to Last Comic Standing? Because you made a great run there. I think you were one of the finalists, correct? I was one of the finalists. That was I did their last season of it, and uh, I got disqualified in the end. Um, so I was in I was in the finals, and how I do it was every week I would you had to write your jokes for them that you were going to do, and it's eight o'clock NBC, so they're a little tight and. Uh, you know, they would go over it with, um, with um, standards and practices and they would pick the jokes you couldn't, you couldn't do. So I would always put these offside jokes in so I could get less offside jokes in, right? So I, their eyes would go there. Well, on the last one I sent in, I put in a joke about going down on a girl for the first time and they did not understand. So they cleared it. <laughs> You're like, how did this one get by him? That's exactly what I was like. No way. So I went up and did it. <laughs> and, and Norm McDonald goes, hey, I can't believe you just did a joke about going down on a girl for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. You're never going to win, but that was great. <laughs> so, so they pulled me aside and they said, you are disqualified. You got a I'm red like, card for, I mean, could you tell the joke again? Yeah. It's a, it's a, I, I, uh, I said, uh, uh, I, I said, everybody remembers the first time they went down on girls. Got a little bit of a kick that nobody warns you about. Right. 
It's it's kind of like it's kind of like having Caesar salad for the first time <laughs> <laughs> with anchovies and some right. of them. Oh yeah, <laughs> little. <laughs> And then I, then I tell some of the girls, oh man, no, nah, it tastes like peaches. I say, yeah, peaches, if it had a battery in it. Right? <laughs> so, but I did that on NBC at eight o'clock. And I was just like, oh my God. I was just like, oh. what a coup. <laughs> oh God. There was that some lady been... in Alabama. Uh, like, oh, oh yeah. Great letters. In. Passed out when yeah. she's watching. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you just mentioned busy that night. <laughs> you mentioned Norm. I mean, abs- absolute oh, legends of the game. He, we lost him a yeah. couple of years ago. Were you, were you friendly with him or did you get to hang out with him much? That was the first time I'd ever met him. And he was a huge hero of mine from when I was a kid, right? So I uh, I do my first set and he goes, I've known Ian forever. I've watched him forever. <laughs> and I was just like, this guy knows who I am, wow. right? And I was, I, was just, I was just shocked and surprised, but I got to hang with him a couple of times and he was always great. And yeah, just a funny guy and just another one of those guys. You just do your thing and be as offside as you can and have fun. I was going to say, is a situation where like your guy's wheels are just constantly turning day in and day out, trying to like take everyday situations and turning into jokes? Like, are you able to shut it off? Um, I th- I th- I'm able to shut it off in certain situations where I just don't say anything. But if I said something, I'd get myself into trouble. Um, but you must yeah, drive your yeah. wife nuts sometimes. <laughs> Oh. She's like, shut the fuck up. My, she says that a lot. My <laughs> wife's an occupational therapist, and I'm pretty sure I might be a, a client, not a husband. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, I know you talked about Cosby earlier. Uh, what, what would you say your top five albums or sets are? And like, since you know, you've been following comedy, like doing comedy, whatever. Like uh, uh, of guys like, that I've liked. Yeah, just yeah. Since the, I guess the last fifty years, like the the best sets or, or like you know concerts or whatever that you, you, what would you say? I say Sam Kinison's anything that he did was insanely funny, offside and poignant. You know, he was he he was he was just so funny. Uh, early early Bill Cosby stuff was was absolutely hilarious. Um, Don Rickles is hilarious. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> But also, I'm a huge fan of Jonathan Winters. Like, I love spinning stuff. Just not, and not just, you know, when you came to the show, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you noticed that it wasn't just, it wasn't just hammered, but it, hammering somebody, but making a story up that was outrageous, yes. right? Yes. So that, that's, that's what I like. That kind of stuff. So, yeah. But those, those, those four, and I, I think, I think Chappelle, honestly, is one of. It, it can't be denied for being absolutely amazing. Like he can take a break where he doesn't get a laugh for four minutes. Like what comedian can do that and still keep their attention? That's the most impressive thing ever. Right. So, yeah. Oh, like you're saying the buildup. Yeah. Yeah. Just tell the story and and, and tell the story and keep people's interest. you know, like, cause you did bring up like people like clips. So you got to keep them laughing like that. Right. And he just, he's able to, keep with the distance it's just like and the laughs are massive at the end of- and, and like mix in like something about like a social issue where he just nails it too and you're like holy fuck yeah. this guy's just got got it all man yeah it, it's he's, he's 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 impressive and but there's so many guys out there like Segura is fantastic kreischer is fantastic a guy named chad daniels there, there's so many great comedians and i feel horrible because i just named three white guys I'm like, can you come up with a girl? Yeah, yeah, mix it all diversity. You know what I mean? Oh my god, hey, canceled over here. Yeah, that is. All so right, guys. Good. As as four white guys sit around and name three more white. Guys. Well, I, I was gonna bring another sit up. Do you remember the first time you watched uh, Eddie Murphy, Delirious? You were probably oh, like 12, 13 years old. The best. Do you yeah. like tell? Do you remember like exactly where you were? Because I, 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 it was one of those like. Are you talking, are you talking to me? Yeah. All right, so yeah, I, tell you. I totally remember. I totally Brian McConnell brought a copy of his sister's tape and we all sat around and listened listened to it on the first walkman or whatever that thing was uh and i, I know you guys don't know what a walkman is oh i had a walkman oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, young i had the shockwave baby i could chuck it against the fucking brick wall and it'll still work <laughs> jesus that's a lot of anger. like that cup from the guy in texas same thing <laughs> he could throw it but it wouldn't break it was amazing uh but i remember us just sitting around and then we just made copies of it. We all made copies of it and we yep. took it home. And it was just, it was, it was the most amazing thing. And it was another one of those things where you listen to and you seen the picture, right? You, you could see what he was talking about. And that's what I've always loved. The guys that I've loved have been able to do. 
Wait, I think that you're really good at that when you tell stories. You're able to paint the picture really well. Oh, thanks, Piss. Yeah, I'm going to do stand up from now on. No, like, I'm, I might oh, do I'll fucking take a compliment for crazy. I said thanks. I appreciate <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. it. Oh, okay. Why wouldn't you guys do stand up? You're, you're no, actually, actually Wit doesn't realize it yet, but I've already worked it out where he's going to be doing stand up. So uh, I hate to break it. He sold a couple life. ad reads and yeah, we're yeah, all good. I just haven't, I haven't been told yet. <laughs> Well, hey, how about maybe we could start with Rose and uh, and Ian. You've done quite a few hockey guys in your day. Yeah, I've not, th- yeah. Well, can we change that a little bit? Can you not say that I've done a bunch of hockey guys? Okay. <laughs> well, like- you were cranking your cock off to the fucking uh, cranking the, cock to the calendar to the Canucks calendar. No, that was you. I brought up the calendar, and you're like, oh, well, okay. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but okay, so you've done, I think, Nick Lindstrom. And- I did, yeah. I did Nick, Nick Lindstrom and. Uh, um, Scotty Bowman. Scotty Bowman. Um, who else was there? I'm trying to think of the first. Brett one. Hall. Uh, no, not Brett Hall. Um, Pang. I've done Pangers. Darren Pang, yeah. Um, and then there was uh, Mickey Redmonds. I did Mickey. Redmonds. How did these come together? Um, uh, they came together. So some of the guys, some of the guys from St. Louis, used to come see me when I used to go to the Funny Bone there, and they were doing Pangers roast, and they contacted me, and I said, "Yeah, I'd do it." So that's how that happened. And then I met Jim Ralph, who does a lot of, uh, you guys know Jim Ralph from Toronto, from Toronto yeah. Radio. So he does all these hockey gigs and he introduced me to people and said, you got to get this guy on after I met him at the uh, St. Louis one. And then uh, I ended up doing those other ones. It was weird chirping uh, Scotty Bowman, you know? So, yeah, I was going to ask you, what the like, what could you possibly chirp him about? Yeah. You had to be yeah, digging what, deep what on you that. Say? Uh, yeah, I guess I, I would have never played on your team. Take that, Scotty, a piece of shit. <laughs> you know, I had no idea. What, so I think I just teased him about being old. I was like, is this a prostate fundraiser? <laughs> <laughs> so, oh. he, 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 but he has a great sense of humor. And, and yeah, uh, he, who was, I'm trying to think, who, was, who had the nickname the Little Beaver? No clue. Uh, that was a slap, slap shot, wasn't it? Marcel Dion. Oh. He, he was angry about something. And he was on one of the dances and he they had to basically drag him off. He was, he was complaining about, and I should have been paid more. You bunch of fucking assholes. <laughs> so his, his, his roast part turned into him bitching about yeah. salary. His, his turned into a strike. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, oh shit. Like who, who are your favorite comedians that you watch or, or, or check up on or make sure you catch their sets if they're doing fresh stuff? Um, I don't really watch anybody cause I don't like to be influenced. I just, I hang out with guys and you know, I, and I just, I know how funny they are off stage. So I know how funny they are on stage and I see how they're doing. But, uh, like the Segura, the Chris, Christina Pazinski, the Chad Daniels, like people like that. And, um, I'm going, to, so I'm going to Kreischer's tomorrow. So, uh, he does a show about cooking. So I'll go there and hang out with him and and do that with him. But he, I did a tour with him. He's, I did a, a podcast in March with him. He goes, why don't you come on the road with me? And I seen Canadian dates. I was like, I'll go do the Canadian dates with you. So I did uh, Saskatoon, Winnipeg, Calgary, uh, Edmonton and, and Kelowna with him. And some of them were in hockey arenas. It was insane. Like 12,000 people just wow. having a lot of fun in a hockey arena. It was great. So, and it's, it's so interesting to see your friends when they, they become a business. Like there, there's people only working because he's telling jokes. Like it's, it's insane. Like there's semi trailers out there because he's talking about his dick. You know what I mean? It makes no <laughs> sense at all. You mentioned uh, before we started recording that you're done for this year. Uh, it's like mid-December, but how many nights were you on the road in, in 2023? Um, I probably did about 30 weeks on the road. <sighs> That's a grind, yeah. huh? It, it, was, it was interesting. I, did, I went to the Middle East this year. I did Dubai, Bahrain, Oman, and Jordan. Uh, so that was a long one. And then uh, yeah, the rest of the year, I was trying to do only three weeks a month, but it turned out to four a lot of the time. So, yeah. Chirping the crowd in the Middle East would oh. probably worry me a little bit. Uh, nah, you can't see them. <laughs> 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 I, I just, I would just ask them questions and then, and then, then tease them, right? You don't, you don't go too hard at them. And I, I could just, I could just tell by their wrists. I'm like, so, so you're rich, huh? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. That's all. That's all I did was just say, so you're rich. I can tell by your watch. You're rich. <laughs> did you have to alter the material lot just because obviously those um, they asked me rules. not to speak about politics or religion. That's all they, okay. they, they asked, you know, and they said, go, go wherever you want to go, but just leave those two things out. And it was, it was nerve wracking. I'm not going to lie. I'm, uh, I'm sitting out front waiting for the first show in Oman and I see these dudes come in and I'm like, holy shit, those are religious police, right? I could tell. And then I asked the producer, I'm like, who are those guys? He goes, oh, they're religious police. They've been here four times today to check on the show. Jesus Christ. No like, pun intended. Like, huh, I guess I should leave a text message for my mom. <laughs> <laughs> I should hide my calendar. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. we, gotta, we gotta stop taking these gigs. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to do everything. Say no to something. <laughs> I, I mentioned uh, you did a bunch of late uh, late night talk shows. You did Conan O'Brien. How did that go for you? Uh, way back uh, in the day. I did a bunch of them. But it was actually Conan O'Brien was my first ever American television show. No so shit. When, huh? I first, when I first came down to New York, I was completely illegal. Um, <laughs> and, and a guy named Lucian Hold, who was one of the owners of the comic strip, would put me on. And one night he came and he said, hey, and there's a uh, there's a audition for Conan O'Brien tonight. You're not going to be on it. I'm like, well, that's great. You know, <laughs> Thanks for letting me know Thanks what I'm me. Be doing. <laughs> but he said, I'm going to put you on just before it. Right. He said that way, if they don't show up, I know I can trust you with extra time and then they'll be fine when they show up. Right. And I'm like, OK, he goes, but if they're there, they're going to see you do your best five minutes. So I did my best five minutes and because they were there and I was the only one that booked the show that night. So that was, it was pretty cool. They came out and they said, Hey, we'd like to put you on Conan O'Brien. And I said, I'm illegal. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, no worries. We'll get your, uh, we'll get your work papers for you. So that was how I got my work papers. That's how I got my first TV show and uh, Lucian actually became my first manager. So, yeah. Wow. So when you're on a late night show, like obviously you have a little plan of what you're going to say, but Yes. You, you have no idea how long it's going to be, correct? Or what he's no, going to respond told. with. No, you know, you know. Oh. Yeah, you know, it's going to be, I think it was my first one was seven. I think they're down to a three minutes when you do light night shows now or something like that. It's oh, yeah. They get the soft. Oscar music going as soon as you end your first joke. Yeah. Was like, Thanks for coming up. So, uh, yeah, I knew exactly what it was. And I was, I was still fresh. I wore my best clothes. And my best clothes were a pair of shorts, a pair of logging boots. And a locking shirt. And I remember <laughs> I remember some guy saying to me afterwards, I like this character you've created. <laughs> <laughs> this is my gear, man. Yeah. I'm like, this is my tuxedo, you motherfucker. <laughs> Biz mentioned the Oscar music. I think he got fucked not getting one for most valuable primate too. Yeah, Sam. <laughs> Sam. One of the best <laughs> movies ever of all times. <laughs> How did that come together? Uh it was uh it was so that's another one of those stupid stories. Uh, I signed with this management company and they said, what do you want to do with your career? And I was tired of hearing that from management and aging companies. I'm like, hey, man, I think I'm here to do stand up. I'd like to do stand up. And uh, maybe you could help me out with stand up and maybe I could be in show business seeing now that's uh, why I'm paying you. But I didn't say that. What I said was I would like to do a hockey movie and I'd like to work with a monkey. And they came back two weeks later and said, what if we could put both of those things into one, <laughs> one, one project? And I'm like, what? And I go, do you want to work with a monkey? And I'm like, yeah. And I go, you like to be in a hockey movie? And I'm like, yeah. And I go, it's a hockey movie about a monkey. And I'm like, all right, I'm in. <laughs> so I spent uh, five weeks in Vancouver playing hockey with a chimpanzee. And it was fantastic. It was so. I played was, with Biz too. <laughs> you fucking asshole. wow crucified over there it was crazy because the monkey could skate better than the trainers and and he would get away every so often on the trainers and we just have to watch these guys that couldn't skate chase a monkey it was pretty fantastic and and the director was out of his mind i remember the first day of filming was hey guys let's just keep it real out there I'm like oh yeah my left winger is a chimpanzee <laughs> But he was legit, though. He could buzz around out there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We could pass it to him and he'd score. Oh, it was great. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, I know back in the day, I, like I said, we're a similar age. Johnny Carson getting called to the couch was like the big deal. You did a set there and he brought you over. Is there any sort of anything close to an equivalent to that today for uh, for comedians? Is it maybe getting a Netflix special nowadays? No, I honestly, I don't. I think Joe Rogan makes the biggest thing for a comedian's business right now. Like huh. that, that is his podcast. Uh, this, uh, when you guys mentioned me on this podcast, I couldn't believe how many people rang my phone like more than when i did the tonight show rang my phone saying hey i heard your name so it was, not more than joe rogan though uh i haven't done joe rogan yet i've been oh, i thought you uh, were on there no, because he's I, talked I, they, about you before they've had a great discussion about me and i've done his club i was at his club a couple weeks ago and had a great weekend there but i haven't i have not been on his podcast the definitely. new one and he opened one in austin right yeah, he, the one in he austin described you as ja dangerously flawless is yes. the way that joe rogan ex ex uh, uh, explained you on his show so you went down to that what do they call that one in austin is the, mothership. Like the, the mothership the mothership and from a comedic standpoint has has like, is he allowed it to open up a little bit more as far as like uh, com the comedy and being able to say whatever you want? Because it seems like it, it it provided something else to the comedy world when it was opened. No, I think it's I think it's just created this place where every comedian wants to go. It's almost like a mecca. Like the fact that I was one of fifty two comedians that got to play there this year blew my mind. Like I had no. I had no idea that in the world I would be picked like one of those guys. So it's where it's where the fans want to go because he's created this place where you know it doesn't matter who's there. They're going to be fantastic. They might not be your style, but they're going to be the top of the top, right? So he's, that's what he's created. He's created this place where it's just, it's not wide open more than other places it's uh the comics love to go there the people love to go there the people that work there they're all comedians and trying to get their careers going and it's 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 pretty impressive with what he's done so uh, i guess it's different now where comedians before would, would get sitcoms like tim allen or something like that but w w would you even want that now or is that not even really on your radar or, or what you're looking for no, I, I don't know. I don't think it's what I'm looking for. I, I've, I never, I don't know. And I don't know if it ever was. I've always, I got into stand up to be a stand up, not to become an actor. Yeah. Right. Uh, I've started doing these vlogs where I go into a city that I'm working at and go find a bunch of things that people don't know about the city. And those, I, I, I really enjoy doing them. I've only done four. I know you guys do your, your, your things, but if this is, this is me going out and doing things. And I think it's a different than anybody else does. Like you guys do your thing. That's different than anybody else does. And it's, it's just, it's, it's kind of my style because I'm basically, I'm chirping the people I'm talking to. Right. So, yeah, it's, yeah. It, yeah, so it, it, in a nice way, you, you know, when I, and I think you guys are the same way we do it, not because we want somebody to feel shit about themselves. We want to let them know they're included. So if I ignore you, you're not included, right? So, yeah. Exactly, yeah. When you mentioned the 22-year-old the kid you hired who really helped your social media explode, like, did he actually reach out to you? Was he a fan or, like, how did that all come together? Oh, no, he, he started working with two other comics, um, uh, Justine, Mar Justine Marino, Justine Marino and a guy named uh, Francisco Ramos. And they both came to me and said, you got to meet this guy. Oh, nice. So like that, which goes back to what the question that was asked earlier, do you guys help, you help each other out? And yes, we do. There's some people we shun, but you know, we try to help each other out because I, I don't, I don't think there's a finite number of people that want to see comedy. It's not like we all just got to get that 100,000, you know? Yeah. So, so yeah, we do. And he, I talked to him on the phone. We had a good chat. I I said no at first, and then we talked again about two weeks later. And I said, "Let's give this a try." And within the first month, I was like, "Oh fuck, we're going for a ride." <laughs> I, I, did you ever see the Dice Man back in the day? No, but I I I I've seen him around the comedy store and stuff like that. I just uh, he makes me laugh still to this day. Just crazy. <laughs> is that more? Is that more of a character? You're talking about uh, no, Andrew Dice Clay. That's, that's him. him? Really? Okay, really. Yeah, I thought that. 
Yeah. I thought it was more of a character. Yeah. Cause it was funny. Italians loved him back in the day, but he was a Jewish guy. It was yeah, yeah. always kind of hysterical. <laughs> if you watch it, you, we, I don't follow his, uh, his Instagram. He's really funny. He just goes up to people and asks them if they want a photo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he baffles them. <laughs> it just makes me laugh. Uh, it's um, really funny. I, I was going to shift over to a question about your podcast. So it's called Enjoying Orange Slices with uh, with Jeff and Ian. Yeah. Uh, do you guys just talk about all these old school hockey stories? Do you talk about current hockey? Like, what do you what do you guys talk about? Is it hockey specific? It is hockey specific. It is about, um, you know, uh, most of the guys that we've had have been retired. Some of the guys still playing. A lot of coaches, a lot of on air people we've had and, and we talk about their life. We talk about the game. We, we, uh, we don't take it too offside. My partner, Jeff is a pilot for Alaska airlines. So he's, you know, he's got, yeah, you don't want to get canned. job. Yeah. He can't, can't be yelling at people, but, um, it, it, we talk about the game. We talk about equipment. We talk about what, you know, their, their feelings. Um, it's, it's, it's been great. We had, uh, Tim Hunter on, we talked about, you know, we want, we had, we had these rumors that we wanted, we wanted to know. We used to hear that he grabbed guys with one hand, two of their hands. And he said, yeah, I used to tie up their, their jerseys and twist it. And then I'd be able to hold it and punch them. And I'm just like, Oh, that is exactly why. I didn't go past midget hockey because I hated being punched in the face. <laughs> so yeah, it's just, it's stuff like that, you know, talking and, and, uh, yeah, we talk, we talk about the Vancouver Canucks. Uh, Jeff lives in Vegas. So he talks a lot about the Vegas golden Knights. He also finished his career in Vegas with the thunder. So he is deeply embedded in, into Vegas. How many Canucks games do you get to watch? Are you, are you staying like, are you watching all the games or no? No, you know, the problem is I, I work at night, right? So I probably get mostly clips of the games. So that's how I watch. But every so often, I, I, I probably watched about seven this year so far. Do you have a, a cup prediction for this year? That's not Vancouver? Yeah, that's not Vancouver. <laughs> oh, that's the obvious one, right? Right, yeah, no, it's very obvious. I don't know. I I think I think Edmonton's going to pull a St. Louis and oh, the shit out of me. Jesus. No shit. Wow, that, that's, that's what a, I that's said. I've been saying the same saying, yeah. shit. Are you stealing my fucking takes? Wow. Ian? The fuck? Steal, no, he's, he's stealing his material. Joke, I thought you said you don't follow other <laughs> <Joke> comics. <laughs> 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 I didn't say I didn't follow other podcasts. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do though, uh, I, and I I do it for a different reason because I fucking hate them. <laughs> oh yeah, they're gonna bend you over just like the Islanders are gonna bend us over. They're probably gonna come out of the East. Oh, did man. you go to the eleven Cup Finals? Any of the games? I did not. I uh, uh, and and I can tell you right now, I knew Vancouver was gonna lose uh, as soon as it. The, the, I was watching it on CBC, and I can see it in my head like a motherfucker. This drives me insane. CBC started playing all these clips of Vancouver, and then they started playing this Adele song called "We Almost Had It All." And this was oh. game one. And I'm like, mother fuck, we are not winning this. And boom, what happened? What a banger, though. Oh, oh, what a great. Hey. Oh, then fuck, they bit, then they bit Bergeron. It was all over after oh, that. It was, it was, I love cranking some Adele. Get me going in the morning. I, oh, I thought you were talking about the series. <laughs> He's got a calendar. <laughs> what a bang. Oh, I'm going to see her live. I think she had her days. hips, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Shakira, Shakira. You know, I just made a, a joke about uh, joke thievery. Is, is that something that uh, uh, comics talk about a lot? And do, do guys know who's like rip, ripping people off? Is that a, a yeah, big deal? We know they don't really last too long. Um, name names, Ian. No, yeah, no, Logan went on stage names. and called out a guy once. I've I've seen that clip. Yeah, who? Him and, him and uh, who, who? Do you know who it was? I, I can't remember. Who no, was. I don't remember. Mencia was the, I, Carlos I, Mencia I was the guy. Carlos Mencia. That's who it yeah, was. They, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't, can you guys explain the backstory him. here? I don't know what you're talking about. So, uh, Carlos was known for kind of lifting things, but not specifically lifting things. Like suddenly had somebody would talk about something and he would talk about the exact same thing. So it was, that's what he was known for. He says he still he wasn't doing that. And it still affects him to this day. Like people go on to his Instagram and call him a joke thief. They like go at him hard and it's cost him a lot of work. And, um, 
I, I don't, I, I never, I, I didn't ever get into that. Like, I don't, I, you know, I'm like, whatever you guys got to fight. I'm more of getting, all right, you stole the joke. Can you do it better than me? All right. If you can do it better than me, go ahead. If you can't, I'm going to come out and do it better. Right. So that's the way I am. Uh, those guys had that fight. I remember I had, I had gotten into trouble. I've been banned from the just for laughs comedy festival. You uh, have? Yeah, I have. Um, like, are you, are you, are you still banned? Oh yeah. 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 Oh yeah. yeah. The one going on oh, in God, Canada, yeah. you've been banned yeah, yeah. from Canadian yeah. comedy. Yeah. 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 It's, it's very Canadian to do that. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, like you know, we didn't like your eating out joke again or what? <laughs> no, there's a there, there was a guy, there was a guy that w- had stolen a joke from another guy. And they were on the same show as me and I was in between them. Right? So it was this guy, it was Andrew and then I can I can't remember the other guy's name, and I won't give any sure. last names, right? So I uh no, no, it was yeah, there was the thief before no. I can't, I, I called them different on the show and it caused a big havoc, right? I call, I said, give it a big, give it a big hand, give it a, give a big hand for Andrew. And it was the other guy, right? Saying that he was, you know, so, so I was the asshole. I was, you can never come back to our comedy. So I'm like, all right, just career me. I like this talk about how catty you can get behind the scenes with all this joke stealing oh, yeah. stuff. That's probably why you don't watch other comedy yeah. for the most part, you said, sure. right? Because I'm a thief? <laughs> no. Because, because you don't might want spark to be an thief. idea. and like, well, uh, I, what's, what's the term? Placebo effect? Yeah, you just don't want to be uh, derivative. You don't want to be influenced at all. So I, I, I just, I want to have my own thoughts. You know, I don't, I, I don't care. I want, to, I want the ice to be, when I go on stage, I want the ice to be clean. I don't want it to be all skated over top of, you know, so I, 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 I like it snowy and choppy, preferably, <laughs> but, uh, uh, one last thing about the comedy. I we're, still is, talk, we're still talking about, uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, snowy and choppy. I like it a little rough around the edges. Uh, a, I was going to ask you snowy and about choppy. your, <laughs> I was going to ask you about your, your, your pre comedy routine. Like, are you a guy who gets very nervous before sets? Like, is no. it, is it kind of, no, not at all. No, I, I, I love it. I, I'm, it, it's exciting. Uh, I don't like to arrive to the venue too close to the show. So uh, on, <laughs> on Friday night, I thought the show was at 7.30. It was at 7. I arrived at 7.20. Um, so <laughs> I'm that guy. <laughs> um, let's you have do some it. drinks before you go on? No, I can't. I, I, I've really... Oh, the last time I drank was 2012 and not like I still drink, but I need time off to drink just because of my recovery. Yeah. And I'm slower. The next show is slower. So, and you've seen the show. I can't be slower than the other. Yeah, you, you're quick. You're quick. Right? So that's why. And I just, it, the, the stage is the bigger drug than the alcohol for me. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Good for you. Thanks, man. I got one. One more, Ian. We're gonna. Uh, I, I want to ask for your comedy Mount Rushmore. We're gonna throw Bill Cosby out just because he's Cosby. We'll cancel him for this. But who who was your Mount Rushmore comedians after Cosby? Uh, I would say Sam Kinison, uh, um, Eddie Murphy. Oh yeah. Um, uh, it is tough. I know. David Tell is the funniest fucking guy in the world. I don't. I don't know if any if the other guys. Oh yeah, I'm a, you, yeah, yeah, familiar it, with them. He's he and and I do believe this. I believe that just like hockey, it's better live, right? Stand up is so much better live. So, um, guys that you may not like uh, clips of will blow your mind live. So, yeah, Ian, I I hate to go back, but you actually are a joke thief. I I remember asking you before (laughs) you came. No, you, you stole the catchphrase covered wagon off me. I did steal covered wagon off you. Uh, I'm coming it after you, bro. <laughs> I'm, I'm You're like, not running your own business anymore. It's my business. I'm coming after wagon. you, buddy. Paul, Paul Bagnasnit. Do you have a covered wagon? Is that why you took it? No, they scare me. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Seen one at the gym and terrified yeah. me. Yeah. I, like, I looked oh, away. I got an ugly Look one, too. I got, I, got enough, I got enough skin on the end to cover a burn victim. Uh, it you looks left like RA uh, reading oh. stats off the R- Mount Rushmore of comedians because that's my favorite. My favorite act is when he gets reading different numbers and then oh. all of a sudden we're just crying laughing by the end of it. 
That's awesome. Well, fortunately, not a lot of numbers with, with comedy shows, but it, did you ever get to see George Carlin? I used, chance? so I, back in the day at the comedy, uh, the comedy magic club in Hermosa beach, I would do a fake talk show uh, in one room and Carlin was on the other one. And we did about eight shows together. And no it was shit. A, yeah, it was. No, it was, really? Yeah. So awesome. I, I just wow. go over and talk to him a little bit. And, uh, and just, just being around that was insane. But during that talk show, that fake talk show, I had shandling on my fake talk show. Oh, so I had a guy wow. who had a fake talk show on my fake talk show. Oh, it was, wow. It was, Fucking it was, meta city. Holy shit. It was crazy. Yeah. So much. Was oh, Carlin man. the one who used to smash the the watermelons? <laughs> oh fuck no! <laughs> fuck no! Oh. No, that was Gall fuck Gallagher. Fuck you, Ian. I'm they're not like, a fucking comedy. Like seven Gallagher's. No, Joey no, Gallagher's I, I comedy see, shamer. I've seen R.A.'s face. R.A. Ah. He's like, what's he the guy that smashed? R.A. was disgusted. Who was yeah. the guy who smashed the fucking oh, watermelons? Gallagher. He wants, Gallagher. He wants to walk you outside and show you Jupiter again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you're a big fan of the sandbaggers, are you? Accept it. I had seen that clip. I just I lost my mind. It was a fucking plane. There was oh an airport God. miles away. And oh, our, that, oh, but the whole thing was just amazing. Just just our age. Fucking, I got to tell this guy. I got to fucking tell this guy. Uh, <laughs> and, and you just being, don't give a shit. <laughs> well, because it wasn't fucking guy. Jupiter. It was a plane. You didn't even look up. It's, you didn't care. It's debatable. You, yes, it's debatable I did. Ball. I looked up after. We have video of it. <laughs> uh, you looked up afterwards, but when he told you, you're just like, I'm playing golf. Because Fuck I knew off. there was not a chicken dick's chance that this guy, inebriated the way he was, could have picked out <laughs> Jupiter. He couldn't see four feet in front of him. He couldn't even see the fucking ball he was trying to putt. <laughs> I thought it was proved it was Jupiter. Uh, oh, yeah. was Jupiter Airlines. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh man! Actually, yeah, I got oh. a, a quick story for, for you. I, it was probably about twenty five, twenty six years ago. I, I was driving in Boston. And I put a radio station on. I never listened to, and they said, "Hey, Chris Rock is coming to the Comedy Connection this weekend. Uh, tickets are on sale." Spur of the moment, I got like eight tickets. Me and my buddies went, and he comes out. You know, it's only a couple hundred people, if that. Burns the place down. Just absolutely melts the place. Hysterical. And about three months later, uh, his next HBO special is, and it's uh, the second one, Bigger and Blacker. And he starts telling the jokes. And I was like, oh, my God. He had been workshopping mm -hmm. uh, Bigger and Blacker. But we had no idea because, you know, pre oh, that no one knew what was going on. That was from the so, HBO that he did yep. in front of you? Yeah, we saw it at the Comedy Connection before he it come on HBO. We but we had no fucking idea, so we saw That's that like the one that intimate exploded set. him too. That like oh my god, split. yeah, yeah. I can tell he's the, the first. Ari's like the crackhead Forrest Gump. He's been like <laughs> a, a part of all these wild, wild things throughout. No, I'm all right. Didn't you end up at like the Rolling Stones show where they ended up filming something and you ended up in a picture in a magazine, like a Time uh, yeah. magazine? Yeah, shine yeah. a light. Awesome. Yeah, shine a light. He's been to every cup celebration since he was born. <laughs> His uh. mom snuck into one, so that's how he actually got it. He was, like, listening to her tummy. <laughs> oh, I'm telling uh. you. What other uh, crazy shit have you accidentally been a part of, all right, or snuck into? Uh, like, there's a few more in there. Yeah, stealing like, cup parties. Actually, this is a whole... I don't think I ever told this on the show. The 1986 Boston Celtics Parade, when they won the championship, <laughs> they, were, on a float. They, they were on these... This was before there were duck boats, and they, there were no barriers. Like, people were just in the street, and they had these, like, DPW trucks. And I'll never forget, they were like chains hanging off. And I, I cr crawled up like a little monkey. I was 14. I was prepubescent. I'm like a tiny little kid. <laughs> and I get up and I'm high-fiving like Kevin McHale and Danny Ainge. I'm, and like literally like during the parade, Danny Ainge like, hey, if they see you up here, you might get in trouble. And like, I was like, okay. And I got like starstruck and I fucking climbed back down like an asshole. But yeah, that, that was another little one. I stuck, stuck in the fucking Celtics parade. Uh, yeah, there's a zillion of them. One, one of the name, coolest... One of the coolest pictures you that I've ever seen is your uh, Twitter profile picture where he was at a WWE event and Andre the Giant loved kids, right? He was yeah. always so nice to the kids and Ari had a disposable and he's like, hey, and and Andre the Giant has a towel over his head walking back to the locker room and Ari snapped one of the fucking coolest photos I've ever seen. So you are the crackhead uh what did, what did Gump, I say? Yeah. That commercial, that commercial, where the kid give, give, where that commercial where the kid gives Mean Joe Green the coat yeah. is actually based on R.A. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah I, I, I got to bring up one more name. I feel if like we have a comedian and we have to talk about Rodney Dangerfield. I mean, yes. I don't know if, no pun intended, I don't know if he gets the respect he deserves in the annals of comedy, but one of the best ever. I was fortunate to see him in, out in our Vegas years ago. Did you ever get to see him? I never got to see him uh, live, but I did meet him at the improv one night and it was, it was just, it was just bizarre how great that guy was and loved by everybody. Oh. You know, that's, 
that's the difference. You can be great, but to have everybody's love too that's around you that works in the business is where where you want to be, right? Like it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're great, but you're a douche. It's you you, you want to be the guy that people want to be around. So and he, he paid it forward, like uh, you know, all the young comedians. He did yeah. that special on HBO back in the day. And actually, Biz, I I went to the show in, in Vegas, and it was early in the day. Me and my buddy picked up the tickets, and we, we were walking away from the box office. And you know those old people lock cots, like goes buzzing by, like like thirty miles an hour. If he hit somebody, would have knocked him over. It's like holy shit, that's Rodney, and he was going over is to it, check for the box cart? office. Yeah, the lot, you know, the lock, lock. I can't say lark, lock cots. And so we went over, and I was like, <laughs> I, I goes, hey, Rodney. I goes, can can you sign my ticket for him? He's like, yeah, yeah, sure, no problem. And, and he signs it. His hands shaking like a leaf on a tree. And I stuck my hand out, and I made him made sure he looked me in the eye. He goes, hey, Rodney, I just want to tell you, you're a true legend. He's like, oh, thank you, thank you very much. Oh, and man. like he looked like an old decrepit grandfather. He come out six hours later with the suit on and fucking just burned the place down. It was incredible to see this like eighty two year old guy get up there and just kill the he, place he took a little bit of a different approach before he went on stage than you right ian like he was uh, yeah, <laughs> i think he, he was, was doing it on stage oh, half oh, yeah, yeah. Wolf? <laughs> doing wolf oh, i liked it all i <laughs> liked it all <laughs> i'm not getting involved in this yeah <laughs> no, I, was, I, uh, I, I got his book i got his book right behind me he'll, he'll vouch for us yeah was no. that just kind of how it was back then ra where all these guys were just getting fucked up going up like well the, the comedy star was known for that like they they still have the there's a uh a piano backstage that is made out of a mirror and that's to do blow on okay so yeah it, it was it was a definitely a different time back then well you, you must hear the uh, ding ho i'm i'm guessing right uh, here in boston there was yeah, the, yeah. The, it was a oh, cambridge it was a chinese restaurant biz and you know, like dennis leary like lenny clock all those guys started off it was like a comedy revolution here in boston and i mean it was as much co cocaine as it was comedy going back then it, it definitely my, fueled it but yeah my huge favorite part of story it. about lenny clark is him he had gets this sitcom just before the gulf war and uh he goes in the first gulf war he gets his sitcom and he goes in with a TV guide to a bank and they give him a loan to a, for a home because he's on the cover of the, <laughs> of the TV guide. That's why 2008 <laughs> happened. Basically. <laughs> it gets a lot. It gets even better, right? So, <laughs> so his, his sitcom's about to debut. It debuts the night where the first Gulf War takes place. So it oh gets bumped. Oh, no. It gets bumped. <laughs> So it lasts like three episodes, and now he's got a house that he got for the <laughs> That is unbelievable. <laughs> oh, shit. Uh, Ian, this has been unreal, awesome, man. Too. Thank you for coming uh, on. This is great. Thank you for Everyone, me, guys. check out Ian Bag, Instagram, Facebook, all your social media. And then what is it? Arn, what is it? Uh, enjoy there your There was only slices? one other question I had. It was like, what if you saw me, R.A., Witt, and, and Grinnell sit in front row? Oh, and Witt's oh. obviously being the pompous asshole with uh, R.A. shaking. <laughs> I'm not sure what Grinelli's doing. I'm probably trying to pick up the waitress. Sitting what would lap. you start slinging at us? <laughs> what would I throw at you guys? Oh, well, yeah. I'd I'd start giving it to us. This is why I went in the back row. I don't want to hear this, dude. No, I'm going to get given to us. <laughs> Just shrivel still, us. Doesn't matter. I'll still find you. That the uh, There's that guy from the Patriots there that night. And I, he, oh, that was amazing. And he wouldn't admit he was on the Patriots. You're like, all right. Awesome. Finally, at the end, you're like, dude, you're on the Patriots. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably because they were 1 in 10 at the time of your show, I think. Yeah, yeah. He, I love it. his his injury was that he tore his bicep from his body. Yeah, I go, did it hurt? And he goes, not bad. I'm like, nice. Ian, Ian, so Ian said he was like, what'd you say he was like a uh, eight IT IT worker or something like that. <laughs> he, was a, he was an IT worker. That's what he was. <laughs> Can oh. you imagine? <laughs> He's got the dreads. Fucking <laughs> six foot eight. He's jacked. jacked. Guy shows up to fix your computer. Huh. <laughs> And crush your old lady. Yeah. It's an episode of black.com. That's how those start. <laughs> Not that I've ever watched. Uh, My uh, wife is <clears throat> stuck in a dryer. Can you help her out? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, shit, man. Can you apply this sunscreen to my wife's vagina? <laughs> yeah. I got a leaky, leaky faucet here. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Ian, we love you, buddy. We, we should do this like again. That. Well, you know what would be awesome yeah. is one of our live shows maybe surprise our guests with you coming out doing a little uh, little stand-up before we I'd go. That would be to, so uh, fun. Toronto, yeah. early February, if you want to come. Yeah, yeah covered wagon tour. Ian Bag Conversations, it's on Prime. I watched it uh, over the weekend, so check it out if you haven't seen Hope it. Hope you had a good, good laugh. Shit. Absolutely. Thanks, Ian. I love, I love that you like Stephen Wright, too. That's the best. This is awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks for being a great...
Is there anything else you want to say to our, our Spit and Chicklets fans, or is that it? No, thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Man, great stuff with Ian. Big thanks to him for jumping on us. Hopefully, we get him on again. I like I like how we're doing this biz, bringing on some you know characters from outside of the hockey world, and you know I guess exposing some of our listeners to some of these people, which is it's been good, man. I'm having a lot of fun doing these. Yeah, I, as much as I love interviewing the hockey guys, I like getting these one offs where we get. I mean, especially a comedian to come on and, and snap it around with and hear some funny stories and, and breakdowns. And where you said you had the chance to go see him, I, I did get invited to one of his shows, but because of my travel schedule, I wasn't able to attend. But this guy's a funny bastard and does unbelievable crowd work. So if you guys uh, take a look at his Instagram or, or any of his social media, take a look at where he's going to head to. And if he's coming near you, I suggest checking out one of his shows. Absolutely. Uh, Patrick Kane looking a lot better than he did with the Rangers last year. He's got uh, six goals, seven assists in 13 games. He had a, he had a four-game goal-scoring streak, uh, a six-game point streak with 11 total points. The first Red Wing uh, since pa- Pavel Datsuk to record a four-game goal streak at the age of 35 or over. Point-per-game player. What, what are you seeing with uh, Kane this year, and how are the Wings looking for you lately? Well, it, it's kind of crazy to think Kane looks this good and the Wings look this bad. Um, and you, you really can't put it on him. I mean, he just looks healthy. He, he looks like a different player from last year. And everything he said, I guess it was exactly true because he didn't have that, that quickness to his game. He didn't have that, that speed to be able to beat people wide, which, I mean, he's never been like the fastest player in the world, but he's just always been so skilled that it, with his speed, he's also able to just create so much. And then there was obviously something lacking. It was just power and ability to push off that hip. He looks great again. He's scoring what seems like at will. But the Red Wings, they're giving up so many goals. They, they can't keep the puck out of their net. And they, they went on that run uh, in November where they were right near the top of the division. And since then, they've lost, I think they've lost 10 of 13. They got a win against Nashville, um, 5-4 on, on the 30, 30th. Yeah, that was Saturday or Sunday. And even then, though, still winning the game, they had to get five. And then they show up, and the next night they play the Bruins at home. They give up another five goals. It's like, I guess this year they're, they haven't won a game, Biz, where they've, they, they've, ha- they've had to score four or more goals to win, to win a game. Like, if they've scored less than four, no they sh- haven't won. No so, shit. It's kind of weird that, like, uh, Lalonde's talking about that they're just making, like, unnecessary risks where they got guys, like, they got defensemen jumping up into the rush, causing an odd man rush the, uh, the other way. They don't really need to do that. And, like, they couldn't score like they wanted to last year, so they got Kane and Debrinkit and Sprong and Gostas Bear, and now they can't keep the puck out of their net. Now, the big part of this is Huso's injured. They need him back because he got another run. He got going. He started playing a little good hockey, but... Right now, it seems like Lyon can't make a save. Reimer can't make a save. So when you're giving up this many goals, it doesn't even matter how good your offense is. So they need to kind of like figure out the defensive side. Stop making these risky plays. Stop turning it over at the offensive blue line and the defensive blue line. And like get back to playing defensive hockey. Like win a game two to one. Because it's not going to matter how many goals you can score if you can't keep the puck out of your net. And goaltending has something to do with it. But everything I'm reading also says that the way the team's playing, it's just not responsible hockey. So in the end, even with Kane coming and being a point-per-game player, it's not enough. So it could look like those three teams that need to make the next step, Ottawa, Buffalo, Detroit, None of them do. None of them are going to make that next fucking step. So they're exactly what we thought of the uh, the Devils last year, where the future's bright, the future's bright. Well, it ain't that fucking bright until you make playoffs. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I uh, do think, I think Detroit ends up getting in, though. You I think, think they're Huso comes in? back and they can go on a little bit of a run. I mean, right now they're sitting out of the wild card right now. The playoffs the Detroit are going to be Wings. insane. They're going to be crazy. Wow. They're, I mean, they're five points out. The problem is there's five teams in front of them. So it's like once you start looking at the points, it's one thing. And then you see how many teams you got to leapfrog. It's like we're, we're running out of time here to get on runs. So you lose 10 of 13. And yeah, you're going to be sitting at the bottom looking up. So it's crazy to think that Ottawa, Buffalo and them all are not in great spots come the new year. Yep. Speaking of that Ottawa, I don't know if you had it written down already. They got they named Steos. Uh, they kind of gave them their official, you know, 
titles or whatever. I mean, you probably got it written down. Uh, yeah, Biz. And uh, Senator's owner, Michael Anlau, made, made an analogy to it, similar to what the Canadians have done with Gordon and Hughes, sort of, a, I guess, a two-headed monster, a, a front office. They sort of bounce things off each other. And like, again, with a, a little bit more of a collaborative effort. I don't know whether the, the buck finally stops with these guys. But either way, I think this is good for the Senators to get some stability in there. I know they've had a chaotic couple of years with ownership and I don't know, basically kind of a, a little bit of a circus going on. But hopefully this can solidify things and they can get back on that course that I, I think people have thought they've been on for a little there's while. There's just now. like so much to keep track of now that I feel like the teams that have the best delegation and resources to pay guys to be able to have the proper people in each situation and then also trusting what those guys are doing and saying and not trying to micromanage. So I like the way that they're looking at, at this team and to change it up from that mentality standpoint. Like that has to be the thought process rather than just having like one or two guys making all the decisions and micromanaging where it's just too much to juggle in my yeah. opinion. So now Ottawa, they need to get least, their coach. They need to just that, get a coach. Right. But I, but I think that with what they've put in place now yeah. makes them a lot more respectable. And then the next thing is, is I mean, if I'm them, I try to go after Barube. You need to, you need to put together a package which gives the coaches a lot of control and also enough money aside from what you're just going to pay. Let's, for instance, Barube. Because if you're getting Barube, you're paying them five times five. I think that's the going rate for a Stanley Cup winning coach. And I don't think that you're going to have anybody who, with any type of credibility who's going to be willing to go to Ottawa unless you're not panning over a bag. And then sometimes, you know, with a, with a Canadian franchise, maybe not wanting to spend a shit ton of money on, on coaching staff, if all the money's going to the head guy, well, who else, who are the assistants going to be? How If you want good assistance now, you need to pay over a million bucks. And not a well, lot of Unless teams you are- go get a guy who's unproven at the NHL level, who you know in junior, he's been really good, and you give him a shot, you can catch a money break on that. Well, that's like, t- that's, so that's like Coach Tourney, right? Yeah. But the problem is, is I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if after going with DJ Smith, who came away from Oshawa, and they gave him the opportunity like that, and it's seeing the way it played out, I don't know how the fan base would respond of them trying that again. No, right? I kind of meant as an assistant, though. Right. Okay, fair enough. Fair, fair, excuse, sorry. All right, thank you for the correction. But Yeah, I they, think need that to go, they need to go, and we talk about old boys club, their next coach has to be like a, a former, at least, NHL coach. Like yes. They can't, they can't with, go again and grab a guy who's unproven. Because they need somebody who has at least had some success at the highest level. Right, right. At least you can rely on that when you're sitting at the podium and you're explaining to the fan base why you just made this hire. Uh, a couple uh, more notes here, boys. Uh, congratulations to the uh, Professional Women's Hockey League uh, kicking off their new season. Uh, new York beat Toronto 4 to nothing in the league's inaugural game. There's also teams in uh, Boston, uh, Minnesota, Montreal, and Ottawa. So best of luck, ladies, uh, to this can season. Can we talk and- about the physicality? Did oh, you yeah, see the yeah. clips, Biz? Yeah, 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 yeah. There's, it's I don't it's know basically if making, contact. Are, are they making a conscious decision where you're kind of allowed to hit? It's basically they, they don't want the open ice stuff, but Along the in boards. the women's game, it's always been the, you're allowed to rub, rub the girls out. Now, international play, they call a lot more. We kind of went through that earlier. But I hope in this pro league, they allow it to fly a little bit more because these girls, I think these girls want to play with the oh, contact. Oh, it was flying yeah. yesterday, dude. Yeah. They want to play with it that type great. of physicality. The place um, was packed, too. It looked awesome. It, uh, the girls are being great ambassadors. They're doing a ton of media stuff. I thought the other cool element, too, is the rules that they've implemented and maybe as part of a tester to maybe change them in the NHL. So what are the cool rules that they, they've uh, changed up? If you're shorthanded and you score a shorthanded goal, your team member comes out of the penalty box. So you're rewarded for getting that shorthanded goal. What was another one that they've implemented? Three points Lo- for a, a win. Three points a, regulation a regulation win, you get win. three points. Without, yeah, which, which, with- I, I, think, I, I think that the NHL really needs to do something about the loser point. It, it, it makes it impossible. Like, we're talking about Detroit trying to get back in the mix. Like, it is so hard with all these teams getting two and one points, with all these games going OT to leapfrog and make some st- jumps. If you're winning regulation games, start giving teams three points. I love that rule. Yeah. Among European other style. ones, so who knows if it's going to be used as a tester because in years past, they've used the AHL as a, a testing ground. Like when they were thinking about implementing the three-on-three overtime, they tried it in the uh, in the AHL first, and they actually did four-on-four for the first four minutes 
and then they did they moved it to three on three in the final three minutes. So actually, overtimes in the AHL were seven minutes at one point. So just little stuff like that is good testers to see what what works and what doesn't. And overall, great job by the ladies and, and, and a great kickoff to their uh, to their league. Well said, Biz. Uh, also, Chicklets TV, keep an eye out for that. We're going to have a new episode dropping from our time here in Seattle. Of course, Game Notes will be dropping another episode with them as well. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube pages, all our social media. Uh, one last note, Wit. Uh, I checked out the Iron Cloth movie. Good stuff. The uh, Von Eric movie, if you haven't I've seen it yet. I've read about it all right. It honestly sounds too sad for me to watch. Yeah, yeah. It's it's definitely not not a pick-me-up. Sounds it, like it, the it saddest was, movie of all time. Um, Or one of them. It's definitely not not a pick me up, but it was a well done movie. I thought it was a, a nice tribute to the to the guy's life and their legacy. So, uh, any final notes other than Happy New Year to our listeners, boys? Um, no, I mean I wasn't very dialed in because I went to Cabo, so I know that maybe there's not as much hockey talk, and we forgot to mention some of your your teams, especially with how chaotic and how many games there were over that stretch of time over the holidays. But we're back in the swing of things. Uh, a great week at the Winter Classic. Incredible job by the NHL. But uh, we're back in the mix. We're going to have some great interviews coming out, and uh, happy uh, Happy New Year to everybody. Go Team USA. Thursday semifinals, Friday final, World Junior. Everyone enjoy that. And yeah, we'll be back next week. We'll be back a little quicker because you're listening on Wednesday. We'll be back on our usual Tuesday. And we'll be all fired up to talk about all things NHL, all things World Juniors. And I hope everyone had a great New Year's Eve. Happy New Year. Crush this year. We're looking to do the same. Love you all. Safe travels home, you boys. 